City Council. Keelan, good morning. Please call the roll. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Ryan. Good morning. I. Hard to see. Present. Maps. Here. Rubio. Oh, I, I see Commissioner Here. Rubio is. Okay, great. Thanks. Wheeler. Here. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronic. Electronically, all members of the Council are attending remotely by video and teleconference. The City has made several avenues available to listen. The meeting is available to the public through a variety of channels. Uh, City's YouTube channel, PDX, www.portlandoregon.gov slash video. Channel 30, the public can also provide written testimony to the Council. By emailing the council clerk at CC testimony at portlandoregon.gov. The council is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and to promote physical distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience. We'll now hear from the rules of order and decorum from legal counsel. Good morning. Good morning. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. The published council agenda at portlandoregon.gov slash auditor contains information about how and when you may sign up for testimony while the city council is holding electronic meetings. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist, and if you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When your time is up, the presiding officer will ask you to conclude. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being placed on hold or ejected from the remainder of the electronic meeting. Please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. First up is communications, Keelan. Item 346, request of Noel Studer Spivak to address council regarding Zenith from a Collie neighborhood perspective. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, esteemed council members. My name is Noelle Studer Spivak, speaking on behalf of Families for Climate. I live in the Cully neighborhood, one of the most racially and economically diverse neighborhoods in our city, uh, with an abundance of industry and the main rail line carrying goods from the Western United States and Canada. Families for Climate and many of my Cully neighbors ask that the city not sign off on the land use compatibility statement, which Zenith needs to continue operating it's Tar Sands Crew Transfer Terminal in North Portland. A land use compatibility statement or LUX from the city is required by the DEQ to renew an air pollution permit, which expired in 2012. There are two critical reasons why the city should not issue the LUX. First, we're in a climate emergency and the future of humanity depends on elected officials doing everything possible to keep carbon in the ground. Hampering fossil fuel companies' access to world markets is exactly what cities need to do. This is how climate leaders hold the line and stop the fossil fuel industry from stealing our children's futures. Second, these trains put our families in real danger. I'm a parent leader at Wrigler Elementary and the dramatic increase in explosive crude oil trains rolling through our school boundaries over the past four years puts us at grave risk. The crude volume flowing through Zenith has quadrupled at the same time that railroad companies have cut inspections and maintenance. We remember the 26 Mosier oil train derailment, and we also remember the 2018 Northwest Metals fire with 500 neighbors evacuated late, haphazardly, and lacking language specific information on how to return home safely. We can't even imagine an oil train explosion. Zenith, uh, so what should you do? Zenith Energy will come to the Bureau of Development Services with a request for a LUX sometime this summer. Those of us living in the blast zone urge the city, specifically Commissioner Dan Ryan and the Bureau of Development Services to decline to issue the air pollution LUX. 
if the city decides to grant the Lux, it would open the floodgates for fossil fuel to flow freely from the Western United States and Canada to the world. And it would render Portland's 2020 declaration of climate emergency meaningless. There is no public input process for the Lux. And this is why we, your constituents, have come before the council for the past five weeks, imploring you to put yourself in your own shoes 20 years from now. Will you regret lacking the moral courage to stand up to powerful carbon interests? Or will you be proud that you linked arms with other city council members along the West Coast to hold the thin green line? Portland's 111,000 children are counting on you to protect them and safeguard their futures. Thank you. Thank you. Next individual, Keelan 347, please. Request of Marilee D to address council regarding Zena. Good morning. Marilee, are you able to unmute? There she is. There I am. Um, my name is Marilee Day. I'm an RN and a, a retired nurse practitioner, and I work for Multnomah County, protecting children's health and children. Um, I'm here to share information about the soaring climate temperatures Zenith is contributing to, and information generated by a study by Multnomah County that underscores the concerns we have of oil by rail in our city. Zenith is primarily uh, comes from the Alberta tar sands. The, the oil is fracked, meaning it's drilled very deeply up to a mile, releasing methane while bringing in the, the uh, fracked oil. Methane is 88% stronger than CO2 and is playing a big part in increasing our temperatures, forest fires, and oceans and droughts. Yesterday, methane extraction was banned by the internal an uh, environmental agency in Brussels and by the UN because of its fast growing heat effects on the Earth's climate right now. To reach climate goals, oil production must be reduced by 75% by 2050, according to the International Energy Agency. What would happen if one of these fracked gas zenith oil trains were to have an accident? More than a quarter of Multnomah County's um, population lives in that blast zone. It's called the evacuation blast zone. It's an area of impact from oil trains if they derail like Mosier or Lake Magantin, exploding and sending toxic smoke, fire, and near in our communities. We are lucky. We were really lucky with Mosier because the wind was not very high and, and, and blowing away from the school instead of into it. In Portland, 108 schools are located in that evacuation blast zone. 100 child care facilities are in that zone. People of color are more likely to live in that zone. The potential negative impacts of oil accident derailments are heightened due to the volatility of this oil. On the basis of this, Multnomah County commissioners opposed the new continued oil proposal permits. The Cullion Neighborhood Association and my group, the Oregon Nurses Association, wrote resolutions opposing Zenith's permit. What are the commissioners going to do now? You have the power to do something to help our safety and our climate. As a professional, health professional, a grandma, and someone who lives in the blast zone, I implore you to take this information, consider it, and deny Zenith's uh, Zenith loop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your being here. Uh, 348, Keelan, my understanding is that individual is withdrawn. That's correct. Would you like me to read it? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Request of Susan Peters to address council regarding a solution to end gang-related gun violence in Portland. Thank you. That individual is withdrawn. 349, please. Request of Robert Schultz to address council regarding bigotry and the fundamental lack of ethics in the Lentz Neighborhood Association. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. All right. Just bear with me because I'm reading this. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, good morning. I'm Schultz from Southeast Portland's Lentz neighborhood. 
I have an issue. My neighborhood association is a body of bigots that fail to follow their own bylaws, city, uh, civic life standards, and even ignore the state's nonprofit laws. So why bring this issue here to city council? Because no one else cares. And this wrong continues to hurt our community. I've witnessed acts of discrimination based on age, disability, gender, and even race. And I've raised these many issues uh, that I've seen through the proper channels to be told by city employees, most recently Diane Riley of the East Portland Coalition Office, that community members should go do something else. She further notes that the city of Portland has failed to honor the promises found in civic life standards and uh, Portland city code, something she as the director will not be changing. Diane advises, don't bother to sue the city when you're discriminated against or wronged as community, community members will never win and the system will not change. The current system crafts this idea that we as citizens can take part in our government and that if we step up to the task, we'll be offered training to better engage and support our communities. It further implies some levels of accountability. The reality is far different. As community members, we are often pitted against each other with city staff occasionally walking through and frankly refusing to listen. Instead, they choose champions, people that echo their personal views and people that literally disconnect from our community while claiming that they are the community voice. As seen with the Lentz Neighborhood Association over the last three and a half years, where you can easily find three opinions on a topic, but are led to believe that there is only one. In fact, it's notable that the Lentz Neighborhood Association meetings have an average attendance of less than 10 people, most of them white homeowners. Distinctly not renters, not homeless, not elders, not first people, not people of color, and certainly not those with disabilities. This is a neighborhood with over 22,000 residents that is also one of the most diverse neighborhoods in our city. Solutions like the, excuse me, situations like this per per perpetuate, perpetuate, sorry, <laughs> situations like this perpetuate a feeling of hopelessness and is a fundamental failure to engage the fine people of Portland, certainly a failure to empower us. The problem is compounded when city staff come to city council claiming to have engaged us while in reality not bothering to speak to even 1% of our community. It becomes a gross misrepresentation and can be seen in angry phone calls, emails, and in conversations at regular gathering spots in Southeast Portland, such as youth events where parents can be seen shaking their heads at runaway representatives and disconnected policy. We need reform. We need a basic change in our government, and that can be that can start right here with you fine folks. How in a modest with a modest level of accountability. Uh, sorry, I see my time's running short. I'm going to be about 20 seconds over. It's all right. When these well-paid city staffers come to you claiming they have spoken to our neighbors, I ask that you insist on a meaningful data that firmly illustrates a robust engagement. When a neighborhood association presumes to take the spotlight, I ask that you request the attendance numbers from the last four meetings. Simple steps like this can easily create an environment that forces change, and it's achievable with only one or two questions from you fine folks. I and many of my neighbors raise questions like these and often bring solutions only to be dismissed and ignored by your city staffers or our neighborhood associations that worry more about their personal agendas than they do about actually making our neighbors better, neighborhoods better by putting forward community concerns that sometimes differ from their many uh, personal opinions. I came to bring these to light. I appreciate your tolerance of my slight overage. I uh, often wish we had more than three minutes, but I do appreciate that there's a lot of folks you listen to. And I hope you can take my two simple suggestions to just ask about who's being engaged when folks come and uh, say that they represent or have engaged our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty has a question or a comment. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Robert, for your testimony. Um, I, as you may know, uh, am having meetings all over with neighborhood associations and neighborhood coalitions. And we, uh, and I'm, I am in the process of ensuring that that office uh, will go back to its core mission of actually civic engagement and engaging with community members. There's clearly some changes that must happen and that is a process. And I will invite you in to hear your viewpoint and your perspective. You've reached out to my office to set a time to talk, and I, of course, will set a time to talk. Thank uh, you so much, Commissioner. I appreciate hearing that, and I absolutely can tell you there are uh, an army of happy to volunteer community members willing to support that kind of stuff. Um, I will tell you, Robert, I have heard that, and what I know is that neighborhood associations have been really phenomenal during this COVID crisis 
the kind of self care that communities have given to each other has just been fabulous and it has not been recognized enough. So, um, and let me just say, Robert, there are, are as many perspectives as there are people in our fine city. So um, we're not gonna agree on everything, but there are areas that you and I, I believe, will be able to make this system better. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll send off something today to your office. I appreciate you uh, addressing the topic so, so uh, pointedly. Great, good conversation. Thank you, Robert. Next uh, is, uh, let next individual, item 350, please, Keelan. Request of Paola Dooley to address council regarding homeless camps and their negative effect on business. Good morning. Paola, are you able to unmute? Yes, hi, good morning. Thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity to speak with you. Um, I spoke with you last month about the homeless situation and I'm very happy that you guys are not supporting homeless camps in parks, so thank you. Today I'm speaking uh, to you as a mother. And to begin with, I'm not anti-vaccine and I have the medical records to prove it. As a parent, I'm deeply concerned about the mental health of our children. A news article was published last week stating that in California, there's been a 25% increase in suicides in children under 18 last year versus 2019. 25%, you guys, let that sink in for a minute. My 15 and a half year old son is seriously stressed about the fact that he has the quote unquote choice of either taking an injection, which has not gone through the full FDA approval process, or wearing a face mask until he does. This is, in, this is blackmail and not in line with our constitutional rights as Americans. There have been over 4,000 COVID-19 vaccine-related deaths in the past four months, you guys. That's more than all vaccine-related deaths in the past 20 years combined. Harvard published an article stating that less than 10% of all vaccine-related injuries are reported to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is known as VARS. VARS updates their data weekly and most recently published 192,954 COVID vaccine adverse event reports, which is up 25% from the prior week. If Harvard is correct with their 10% underreporting statistic, the 192,954 is actually 1,929,540 who have been injured. Many doctors and scientists are speaking up saying these injections should be pulled off the market. I can send you guys so much information on this. But our government and Governor Brown are doing the opposite. They're supporting Big Pharma and not listening to the people in this country. And instead, they are threatening Americans with statements like, the rule is now simple. Get vaccinated or wear a mask until you do, President Biden. This is in direct violation of the United States Constitution, which is the supreme law of the United States. Forcing US citizens to either mask up or take the injection falls under the Eighth Amendment of the US Constitution. If Big Pharma was held legally liability for potential damages, I'd be more open to this new injection, but they're not. They're 100% indemnified from all liability and thus have no incentive to make a safe product. If we don't stand up to this medical tyranny, we've lost everything and not just for this generation or the next, but for all generations to come. And I urge you to wake up and fight for our constitutional rights as US citizens like other states such as Florida and Texas are doing, but Oregon is not. Our elected officials are rolling over bellies up and sacrificing our children and their futures. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Keelan, uh, we'll do the consent agenda. Have any items been pulled off the consent agenda? We've received no requests. Please call the roll. Ryan. Hi. Hardesty. Aye. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Wheeler? All right, the consent agenda is adopted. Item 351, time certain for 945. 
authorize an agreement with Travel Portland for the marketing and promotion of convention business, tourism, and overnight lodging using a sole source procurement and provide for payment. Colleagues, I'm pleased to jointly introduce this item with Commissioner Maps, who is the city's liaison to Travel Portland. Today, we're gonna to review the proposed new five-year agreement with Travel Portland. This agreement continues the successful relationship between both the city of Portland and Travel Portland, which goes back many, many years. As our recognized destination marketing and management organization, Travel Portland plays a key role in the success of travel and tourism in the region, which in turn plays a very important role in our economy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Maps. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I'm addressing council this morning because I have the privilege to serve as this council's liaison to travel Portland. And um, along with the mayor, I sit on the Visitors Development Fund Board. In those roles, I've had many conversations about how to attract tourists and conventions back to Portland. And I've learned about the relationship between the investments we make to bring tourists and conventions to Portland and the economic benefits those visitors bring to our city. Uh, for example, pre-pandemic, for every dollar we invested in promoting tourism, Portland yielded $34 in economic benefit. Now, of course, COVID devastated Portland and our tourism and convention business. But I also have good news, and I think we'll hear about that uh, um, today. Uh, Portland is making a comeback. Things are starting to turn around. Tourists are starting to return to Portland. And businesses, even hotels, are starting to open up again. For example, last Friday, I visited some downtown businesses to see how they were doing. I'm happy to report that Wolf Bank uh, Women's Clothing is doing better than ever. Aurochs Leather makes me proud to be a Portlander. And if you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to swing by the Moxie Hotel, which opened up downtown just two months ago. Uh, they have a great bar in the lobby, and it is a beautiful, distinctively Portland place. And you know what? Uh, the Hyatt Regency at the Oregon Convention Center will reopen on May 24th. Um, let me also share this. One of the things that my office does is to talk to convention planners who want to visit Portland but have concerns. I tell them this, Portland is open for business. Portland is still a great place to visit. Portland is still the city of roses and we are still the Portland that you love. Please come visit us soon. And now colleagues, let me turn to the business at hand today. We're here to help authorize an agreement with Travel Portland for marketing and promoting uh, convention business, tourism, and overnight lodging. You might remember that last month we uh, approved a new 1% tourism improvement district fee to help pay for this campaign. Back then we asked Jeff Miller to report back to us in October on the work they're doing to ensure that hotels throughout the city are well represented and how they can lead with diversity, equity, and inclusion in their work. Today, I believe we'll hear about how some of those reforms are included in this new contract. And with that, I will turn this over to Carl Lyle. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioner Maps. Uh, Carl Lyle, um, Spectator Venues Program Manager. Um, so the ordinance before you today will authorize the mayor to sign a five-year agreement, a new five-year agreement with Travel Portland for a broad range of services related to the marketing promotion of conventions, travel, and tourism in Portland. Uh, the services covered by this agreement are prescribed in city charter section 7-113, which regulates the city's transient lodging taxes, and city code chapter 6.05, which regulates the fees associated with the city's tourism improvement district, which was, as Commissioner Maps just mentioned, amended and expanded earlier this year. Uh, the agreement outlines the tasks to be performed both by Travel Portland and the city and assures that these efforts are undertaken in partnership. This model of collaboration between the city and Travel Portland has a long track record of success, including in previous times of economic hardship and recovery, like the one we find ourselves in now. Uh, the agreement also contains performance measures, which are used to measure and track success because of the uncertainty around the speed and degree of post-COVID recovery in the travel and tourism industry. Some of the performance measures have been written to accommodate adjustment over the next few years as things become clearer. Jeff Miller will provide more details about these services and the measures in the agreement in just a moment. 
Uh, the charter and code also prescribe specific attributes about the organization the city must contract with for these services. The organization must be an Oregon nonprofit, a comprehensive destination marketing organization uh, operating in Portland that is engaged full time in the promotion, solicitation, procurement, and service of convention business and tourism in the city. Pretty specific. Because Travel Portland is the only Oregon nonprofit meeting those charter and code requirements, this contract is being procured using the sole sources exception in the city code, chapter 5.68, and the professional technical services um, contracting manual, which included posting of the request for a period of seven days during which no challenges or objections were received. Uh, staff from the Revenue Division are also with us today on the call and can respond to any technical questions, should there be any, about the tax collection and distribution systems. Um, this is a regular ordinance. Uh, we'll pass to second reading next week. Uh, I will turn this over now to Jeff Miller and be happy to answer technical questions after that. Thank you, Carl. Uh, good, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioner Maps and all of Council. First, let me say it's been gratifying to have such good partners on council and city staff. Our continued job of creating economic impact through tourism is now more important than ever. Your $150,000 investment in our online travel campaign primed the pump for the first work of recovery. And your support of the increase in TID for five years will make our ability to restart the tourism economy much quicker. And I wanna thank the hotel community who stepped forward to make it happen. As Commissioner Mapp said, we have been keenly focused on ensuring tourism lifts up all communities. We've had a focus of bringing more diverse conventions to Portland for many years, and we continue to grow our efforts, and you'll hear some of those efforts today. I'll start with the sobering news we've been waiting to see released. Dean Runyon has done the tourism economic impact research for We and Travel Oregon for many years. You'll see on the chart the drop in spending, earning, employment, and tax revenue. None of this is surprising, but I will say that I was shocked to see that we have been drugged back to 2003 due to COVID and some Portland specific reasons. Recovery has begun, but we've got a hill to climb. This is a screenshot of the quarterly report we provide to the city and to Merck. This report is an in-depth look at all of our efforts and results for each quarter of the year. We track a lot of information in this report, but today I wanna to talk to, this, to you about the city contract measures, how some of those have remained, some are enhanced and some are new. Our plan for 2020-21 was to be a benchmark year, but COVID has persisted and we still haven't hosted an in-person convention. The first one's coming in August, we hope. So for many measures, depending on recovery, it will take two years to get to the benchmark and then set goals for the future. We'll continue to report honestly on recovery. These measures are in much more detail in, your con in the contract and your packet, and I'll summarize the important parts and changes. One of the most easily measured programs is convention sales and services for the citywide and single hotel meetings. Our last goal was 25 to one, and we exceeded that at 32.4 to one in 2019. We're hosting a number of meeting planners for book conventions who want to return and see the city for themselves. The good news is that most of the planners who've come have said Portland doesn't look as bad as the media would have you believe. Now there's a, not a surprise. They do still have concerns about delegate safety, so your efforts as council to stop the small violent groups and getting boards down from businesses will help us all feel better about the city we love. To this end, we've created a large fund to host meeting planners to uh, planners of existing meetings. We'll fund up to two planners to see the city and experience it as we recover. And as our convention trade show travel resumes, we'll have the hotels submit applications for their salespeople to join us and we'll pay the travel expenses since the hotels have had to cut their travel budgets. We also created a single hotel meeting incentive fund. Travel Portland will tap 1% TID funds of $400,000. It will help us save business that is on the books and find new business that we can incent to come to Portland. Lastly, we'll partner to enhance the Sport Oregon program of work to better attract youth sports and sporting events. Youth sports benefit hotels outside the core. Jansen Beach and the airport certainly are pleased with this direction. This goal is enhanced and more focused than our previous measures of minority conventions. This work has been part of our sales program for many years. Some of you saw our annual presentation in December where we showed the annual diversity event we do with meeting planners based in Washington, DC. 
Our goal is to ensure more diverse partner businesses are connecting with meeting planners coming to Portland. Our VP of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion will be a key leader in this work. Educational and training activities will include networking events, My People's Market, and a company called Local, L-O-C-L, that help, helps brick and mortar stores exploit their Google My List, Business listings. And we've long reported our efforts and results to attract- Jeff, Jeff, I'm sorry, but before you go off that, I, I, I wanna make sure Commissioner Hardesty has a chance to, to ask a question here. Yep. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, Jeff. Um, and let me say, um, um, uh, as always, an impressive presentation. <clears throat> Before you go too far, I don't want to leave the uh, bringing um, convention planners to town, um, showing them the city, uh, trying to entice them to come back. For me, I want to know what's the story you're telling them about where Portland is now and where Portland is headed? What I would say is we are we are being completely honest about where Portland is now and what our history has been, and how as a city we are working together to be a better Portland for the future. We're unapologetic, um, but we are looking to the future to be different than the past and better for all communities. And I think the work that we're doing certainly uh, I'll, I'll talk about the new contract we have with a marketing company that really speaks to how we are looking at changing that narrative as well. Um, I thank you. You showed an earlier slide that showed the devastation as far as employment opportunities um, and what really COVID has done uh, to the city economically. What we know is as of June 30th, uh, when the eviction moratorium expires, it's anticipated we're gonna have 10,000 new Portlanders uh, that are gonna be houseless. And so I guess we are a tale of two cities. We are a, we're a city that is in a economically devastating time for many, many, many working people. And we're also a city that knows that we are attractive to tourism and conventions, um, and we want to reemerge stronger for more people. My concern is what I'm reading in the paper and the narrative that's happening is that we need to disappear houseless people so that we will be attractive for these conventions of the future. I, and I just wanna be clear, uh, the reality is, is that we have thousands of people living on our street in every neighborhood um, and I, and so I, this is why I wanted to stop and have this conversation, because it's important that we tell the real story about what's happening and how devastating this economic reality is for so many Portlanders. And I just want to make sure that we're not painting a false narrative and we're not making promises that we aren't able to keep at this moment. I don't think we're making any promises that, that we can't keep. And I think uh, Travel Portland has worked very closely with the county and the city, the Joint Office of Homelessness just presented to our board. So we understand what the issues are. And you likely know that the county got uh, a significant portion of funds out of the lodging and rental car tax to help with supportive services around homelessness. So the industry is investing in that. And we wanna see compassionate care for people living on the street and move them to shelters where they are safer and ultimately to housing, which is should be all of our goal. Um, and uh, you would find no disagreement on this council. The question is how soon are we gonna be able to do that? And it's not gonna happen next year or the year after or the year after. So what do we do between now and then? That's the question. Well, we continue to, to create economic impact for people to and create recreate those jobs. I know right now as the Hyatt opens on May 24th, they have hundreds of employees coming back to work. And so our role is to really create that economic impact through tourism and showing Portland as a very attractive place as it is today, as it is next year, as it will be into the future. And we believe that economic impact and those jobs will help alleviate some of the issues for people that, that are indeed in the, in the workforce. Thank you, Jeff. I know you didn't create where we are, but it's really important to me that we have this open and honest conversation because I do not want to paint a picture um, that A, this council has does not support, like uh, busing people out of downtown Portland, 
um, as far as I know, this council doesn't support it. But based on what I read in the paper, there's a plan to do that. And I'm not interested in that plan. Well, I can Thank assure you. you I know nothing of the plan and we wouldn't be supportive of that either. Shall I resume? Thank you. Yes, please. Okay. Um, uh, one area that we have measured is our spend with diverse businesses. And as you know, a lot of businesses don't have the state COVID certification, so they can't necessarily be counted for the city and metro. We'll continue to track this business, but we'll only report COVID firms, which will affect this number. And I know that's an issue that uh, the city and metro and we are certainly working, working on. I'm very pleased to announce also that we've reposted the job opening to fill our Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. This is a position that we had and we're recruiting for just, uh, just as the pandemic closed us down. So we had to make a pause. We are working with Searchwide Global, who does recruitment in the hospitality and DMO industry, but they are casting a very wide net locally as well as nationally. The position will report directly to me and be focused on the many DEI goals of supporting the community, our sales goals through community partnerships, and training both internally and in the hospitality community. Another area council asked me to report on in October is to how have minority candidates benefited from the rehiring happening in hospitality. And as you know, Travel Portland was a charter member of Portland Means Progress. I've connected the team at PMP and more importantly, the navigators to our hotel partners. We've pushed their contact info to all of our board members and are on schedule to present to the PDX Lodging Alliance as well. It will, be, uh, it will be difficult for us to track the numbers for hotels, but we will monitor as best we can for those stories of success. I've shown you many slides over the course of time from Smith Travel Research who collect data from the hotel industry. It's an amazing research and gives us in our hotel community data to make good decisions. They are a subscription research company, so many independent properties, usually in the 50 room or less size, don't su su subscribe. So for instance, Smith Travel reports nine hotels on the east side, and we know there are many, many more. Our solution is to work with the Revenue Bureau to understand tax collection data from each part of the city on a quarterly basis. By examining the percentage of lodging tax and TID remitted in each part of the city and the percentage change over time will give us a better data of success. They will provide this data uh, by the 25th day after each quarter so we can include it in our quarterly report, which you will receive. Uh, this current measure of uh, lost opportunities, we haven't really had to pay much attention to this until the last year and a half, uh, but we will still be uh, looking at it and, and counting those lost cancellations of which we've had quite a few. We've measured our international success against other U.S. cities. Jeff, with Jeff I'm sorry, Commissioner Hardesty has another question. Uh, thank you, um, Mayor. Um, Jeff, uh, the, were you, you were tracking uh, the uh, diversity in uh, rehires, and I think the question was more about your organization as you, because you shed at 80% of your workforce, and so the question was very specific to how are you using an equity lens to actually rehire and promote and move people through uh, your organization, Travel Portland. Not, uh, the industry is good, but we're, we were talking specifically about you. That's actually really good to know because we had a conversation with city staff about what, what the objective was. And so that's much easier for me to answer. And I can assure you, um, we are very focused on that now. And uh, as I said, we have the diversity uh, VP of DEI hire out now, and uh, that will be the second hire back uh, of the 40%. The One of the employees that we did bring back, of course, was from a diverse background. So we are paying very strict, good attention to that, and we'll be able to report in October exactly how many people we've hired back. I should go on. Yes, okay. I'm on two screens, so I, I, I'm having trouble seeing you and, and following my script, so sorry about that. Um, international direct routes in Portland have been canceled until at least this fall, but this measure will take some time to understand, but we remain committed to growing international uh, Portland's international reputation as flights return. And these photos are, are of a small My People's Market we took to Japan two years ago as part of the mayor's trip to our sister city, Sapporo. 
And the very good news is Delta has announced nonstop service to South Korea in the fall. And this is an incredible addition as Delta's ability to move passengers beyond into other parts of Asia is substantial. We have long-standing ties to tourism promotion in Korea, and the book you see is a Korean guidebook modeled after one we helped fund in Japan. So we're looking forward to getting back into this lucrative market. Objective six, we'll do a biennial survey and ensure broad representation from our regional counties and with Travel Oregon. Objective seven, we'll measure and report total impressions, key messages such as arts, culture, and food. And we will measure and report me media engagements of minority owned businesses with a goal of 100% in every pitch. And those are often much more. We'll report consumer sentiment of Portland from a national audience. And objective eight, we will uh, once again, once conventions resume, we'll conduct meeting planner surveys. And in 22, 23, we'll conduct and present at least survey, six surveys a year. We started our recovery, and again, thank you for the $150,000 grant from the Spectators Facilities Funds to get us started with the online travel agency campaign. To help reignite overnight visitation to the city, Travel Portland launched partnerships in April with the three key booking platforms, Expedia, Priceline, and Airbnb, that are promoting Portland for their customers in targeted feeder markets. On Expedia, customers are being driven to this Portland landing page where they're immediately greeted by a booking engine through which hotels in every corner of the city are visible and bookable. And we're, here's a portion of the Priceline landing page, which includes a photo gallery where we're highlighting a range of Portland area experiences and minority owned businesses. Our investments with the OTAs here are already paying off. In April, Expedia and Priceline campaigns combined to generate 13,000 incremental room nights. And for the month, both delivered an ROI of more than 20 to one. So we know that those dollars are working. These partnerships will run through July and we're looking forward to maintaining the momentum generated in April. We forged a partnership with Airbnb, which created a cool neighborhood guide and they're promoting to their key feeder markets. We worked with them to select five neighborhoods throughout the city that offer a range of visitor experiences, minority owned businesses and compelling food cart options. We're also working to leverage and amplify the positive buzz about the city being generated by Top Chef Portland. To do so, we forged two content partnerships with Vox Media. The first is with Vulture, which will produce a series of episode recaps. And the second is with Eater, which will produce two of their popular heat maps to highlight Portland culinary locations. The first heat map, which launched May 14th, highlights the Pan-African restaurants and food carts in episode three. And the second heat map, we're partnering with Gregory Dorday, who's identifying some of his Portland favorites, which are certainly uh, diverse and eclectic. These efforts, Expedia Priceline, Airbnb, and Top Chef will be amplified this summer by a full-throated marketing campaign designed to drive leisure travel demand. We're partnering with the local firm industry, whose offices you see here, and the summer campaign o dovetails with Travel Oregon's recovery efforts and will target leisure travel travelers. Excuse me. Industry is a minority-led and is the process of being certified by the state as a minority-owned business. And here's Oved Valadez, the executive creative director and co-founder of industry. Travel Portland knows that it takes people with different ideas, strengths, interests, perspectives, and cultural backgrounds to do our best work and to best represent our destination from a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. As a result, we're committed to working with a diverse creative team on this project. And industry believes, as does Travel Portland, that the best work comes from a diverse group of life experiences, opinions, creative backgrounds, and above all, people. In order for us to find this creative partner, we overhauled our request for qualifications or RFQ process. To do so, we enlisted the help of a DEI consultant, Jesse Hyatt, whom we found via Prosper Portland. And with Jesse's expert help, we sharpened our language to better reflect our commitment to DEI and to make clear our desire to find a diverse team to be working on our behalf. As always, we push the proposers to demonstrate their commitments to DEI, but for the first time, we captured the demographics of the project teams that were assembled by the various proposers. We are incredibly pleased with the response, 24 total proposals, but we didn't find just one winner. Our list of five finalists include three black owned firms, which we will kind of contract with in 21-22 to produce much needed content for us. These new partners will play an important role as we tell more stories and new stories from different perspectives that help us shift the narrative about the city. When I report back to you in October, we'll share details of the summer campaign and our partnerships with these additional creative partners. 
Near, nearly all of our media work during the pandemic has been reacting to journalists' requests about the impact of pandemic and protest. Our teams have been focused on creating messaging and communications for departments, getting sensitive questions and concerns from clients about the city, from consumers and meeting planners. We re-engaged our New York PR firm, Lara Davidson PR, to do a media audit on perceptions of Portland for travel publications perspectives, and we were pleased that overall they continue to see Portland as a compelling destination. We also have enhanced the media measurements to monitor the size and impact of negative media coverage. Our team will ensure that all proactive media engagement will include at least one diversity business, and in reality, they almost always include numerous story ideas since there are so many compelling stories to tell. Media hosting will resume and will we'll provide greater opportunity for minority content creators and outlets to cover the city with dedicated budgets for hosting. We will ensure the city's diversity is covered by diverse voices. And we'll look to do media activations in select media markets such as LA, San Francisco, and New York, where, when the, where these events have been productive in prior years. And lastly, supported by our hotel community partners, we'll support the Portland Film Office with $150,000 increasing annually by CPI, as long as we have the additional 1% TID funds. Our team's worked long, uh, has long worked with Brian Lord as we've uh, hosted productions like Who is the Mole, which was a Dutch production that filmed here in Portland a few years ago, and certainly Top Chef. His expertise in permitting and connecting local crews to productions has been a huge help for the city's film industry, and we'll work together over the next year to develop a program of work that not only helps productions coming to Portland, but to find new ways to recruit more film projects to the city. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Very good. Colleagues, any questions at this particular point? That was an excellent presentation. If not, I'll ask Keelan, do we have public testimony on this matter? No one signed up for this item. Very good. This is a first reading, but colleagues, I'd like to, uh, after Commissioner Ryan speaks, I'd, I'd like to make a few comments. Commissioner Ryan. Oh, sure. Um, thank you, Mayor. Jeff, it's always good to see you and thank you for your presentation. And the dialogue earlier with Commissioner Hardesty was important. Um, let's see. I think what I was impressed with is your intentions um, and to operationalize racial equity. And you had some um, goals and uh, plans. When you come back in August, or August, when you come back, I think October would make more sense, right? After the summer, because our summers are go through September. Uh, what would we expect? Like, what kind of metrics would you bring to us that you're measuring um, over the summer? I couldn't, I wasn't sure if I saw that. And I've had a lot of fits and starts in my career on this. And I find it's really important to have clarity about uh, what that is going into it. And maybe it was in there when you told me what the goals were and I just didn't track that. Uh, the goals are much more specific, certainly in the documents. And uh, so what I would say is that we've always tracked minority conventions that we are recruiting. Uh, Commissioner Hargesty will remember that we went back to Baltimore many years ago to, to try and attract the NAACP. We didn't unfortunately get it then, but, but we've continued to work. And there are many, many of those organizations that we are attracting their conventions. But what we also need to do and have done is created partnerships like with the Hispanic Chamber, the Black American Chamber, to, to help us represent the city in all its facets. And that has been wildly successful uh, as we've tried to connect because we can, you know, at, we hosted a group um, uh, probably about a year ago and we had a, a all the diverse organizations showed up on a Sunday night uh, at the Hilton for a, a cocktail reception, and we got that piece of business. Uh, the National Council on Race and Ethnicity, another co uh, convention that came here, Commissioner Hardesty spoke at that, uh, and we had a My People's Market. So we are very intentional about sort of counting those. Uh, we will uh, report to you on media pitching, uh, which will, uh, as I said, will always include at least one diverse businesses. And frankly, they generally include more because there are so many good stories to tell. Uh, we will uh, report on hiring, uh, sort of a whole gamut of, of metrics around DEI. And by that time, my anticipation is that we'll have the vice president of DEI hired and I, I will bring them with me uh, to sort of talk about their program of work, which we should have in place by then, which really is around not only trainings in, internally with Travel Portland, but in the hospitality community. 
uh, which we, we know we need. They won't do that, but they'll help us organize getting that done. So it, it's multifaceted. And I would say that the TID um, increased conversation was very good for me and my team. And those five questions that were posed are emblazoned on all of our uh, PowerPoints and we talk about them and, and we have a file that we are putting into sort of everything that we are doing towards those. So it really focused me, it focused my team and it certainly focused our efforts. Not that we weren't already paying attention but it, it provided that extra level of focus that I think we all need to have right now. I appreciate that. And I know you used uh, the ROI language was something at 20 to one. What, what was that again? I can't remember. That was on the uh, online travel agency campaigns, Expedia price line. Uh, it's 20 to one on the, the monies that we've used in April. Right. We'll continue to monitor that. So I think uh, maybe a comment then would be, um, I think when we, when we look to operationalize equity, there's actually tons of ROI in that as well. And sometimes I think we miss out on making that case. I know when we were trying to make the case you know, 15 years ago on why it was important to increase the amount of investments for uh, children who are African-American, Latino, and um, also a Pacific Islander specifically, we showed the trends of the, of the population growth, especially with the Latinx community, and that it really was an economic imperative as well if we didn't start seeing better success because those are our future employers and employees. So I think um, it's always because you're in that world of a uh, bottom lines and ROIs. I just encourage you to also look for that in your metrics if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. One area in our research that I will say uh, on the, sort of the national trends is that we found that we have a, a larger audience with uh, the Hispanic community than we realized. And so I think from a marketing standpoint, there are some opportunities that we're already seeing that we can. Uh, leverage there that uh, it's been good to do that research so that we're coming at this uh, really from a data-driven standpoint. Yeah, and economic justice is a uh, bottom line as well. So thank you so much, Jeff. Good to see you. Great thank report. You. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, you know, people that listen to our earlier conversation may not know how well you and I work together, right? Um, and they may think that you and I are not focused on the same vision, um, and they would be wrong. Um, and what you uh, laid out based on the five questions that we asked you to start tracking, I want you to know how impressed I am that not only did you take those five questions to heart, but your management team is looking at those five questions and have them posted and are developing benchmarks that can be tracked. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people come in front of the council and talk about their work around equity and inclusion. And, you know, it sounds fabulous. But um, when you look at the outcomes and who's benefiting, we find out that we haven't moved much in Portland in 30 plus years. And so I want to applaud you for, uh, you know, being tough enough to take the criticism, but also going back and doing the work to make sure that the systems are going to be able to answer these necessary questions. Um, I applaud you and your team, and as always, I will be available to help promote Portland any place you need me to be. Um, and I appreciate you telling a real story about Portland because we will be a story of uh, resilience and coming back and being stronger and being more equitable and being much more transparent in who benefits and who doesn't from the riches that we have here in Portland. So I thank you for doing your part. And again, I am at your service to do anything I can to help promote Portland. Well, thank you for that. That um, you, We do have the same goals. We do work well together and uh, we have the same mission. Uh, and I appreciate you challenging us and keeping us on track as well. Very good. And I just want to uh, underscore what your report said, Jeff, the benefits to Portlanders in terms of jobs and visitor spending from travel and tourism are self-evident. And uh, in addition to that, the city's general fund benefits from the collection of transient lodging taxes, as you mentioned, that's almost $31 million just in the last fiscal year. As you noted, the pandemic's impacts to Portland's economy have been immense and they've been uneven. Particularly hard hit, has, as has been acknowledged, have been our 
communities of color, immigrants and refugees, and uh, folks who are just entering the job market, including young people. Job creation and travel and tourism related businesses, I believe is going to be key for the recovery, not only of the city, but also for many people who live in this city. We know that under ordinary circumstances, by ordinary, I mean going back a little over a year, the industry provided as many as 40,000 jobs in our region at many different income levels and different experience levels from entry level to the advanced. There is a high level of minority representation in the industry and many small businesses depend in part upon the travel industry returning and doing so robustly. We know from your many years of success that Travel Portland knows how to entice people to come here and how to get them to places where they want to spend their money within our city. I think your approach to encouraging them to try different aspects of their city that they may not read about in some of the travel logs uh, and encourage them to, to look at some of our uh, younger establishments, new establishments, establishments owned and operated by people of color has been exactly the right strategy. And I want to encourage you to continue to focus on those kinds of strategy. This agreement that is under consideration will allow Travel Portland to build on its excellent track record. And I'm also very confident, it's been raised by others, that in collaboration, the city and Travel Portland will be able to successfully navigate the challenges created by the pandemic. We can work together to support a strong recovery that brings people back to this wonderful city. And so I wanna thank you for being here today. Uh, ordinarily, I'd say all those things when I cast my vote, but since you won't be here, I wanted to say them with you present. Uh, I see Commissioner Maps also has his hand raised. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, while we won't vote on this ordinance until next week, I did want to take some time out to make a few comments today. Um, I want to start out by thanking Jeff for joining us and providing us with that uh, um, really fascinating and well-executed update. Um, let me share some of the things that I heard. Um, I think today we heard that the COVID pandemic has wrought devastating losses on practically everyone, but the sheer number of jobs lost in the uh, hospitality industry here in Portland has been devastating. Um, it's good also to learn that things are starting to turn around, um, but I think we also learned today that there's a lot of work still ahead. That's why our partnership with Travel Portland is so important. You know, uh, we all know that Portland is blessed with many attributes that make us a great place to visit, but many of them, our food scenes, our entrepreneurial businesses, our cultural off offerings have been um, damaged by this pandemic. How well we bring travelers back to Portland will determine how quickly our community rebounds. I'm confident that by working together, the city and travel Portland can send a message to people around the world that Portland is open for business. We offer great hotels, great restaurants, entertainment, and other experiences. We invite everyone to please come visit Portland soon. We are still the Portland you love, and we look forward to welcoming you back to the city of Roses. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to also just take the quick opportunity um, to, to thank you, Jeff, and Travel Portland for the presentation and your thoughtful um, answers to our questions. It's really clear to me that you take these things to heart and it's evident in the work that you presented today. Um, like my colleague said, we have some big rebuilding work ahead of us and um, we look forward to collaborating with you. Um, on this and also thanks so much for the deep dive into the areas that, that better reflect the totality of who Portlanders are and what we all have to offer. Um, that was really lifted up for me today. Um, and I also am really glad to hear that you're partnering with culturally specific chambers on this work. And if, if I may offer a suggestion um, to consider partnerships with other culturally specific and community-based organizations that can really lift up the rich tradition of, of neighborhood and community events and diverse community events 
and engagement um, in our neighborhoods and our communities. Uh, because these things have also uniquely shaped our neighborhoods and arts and culture and, and really the Portland experience. And I know that this would appeal to a lot of, of travelers wanting to come visit our city. So I'm very eager to hear about your progress and look forward to your next updates. Well, I can assure you that you will also get an invitation to meet with groups as they are coming in town. So be prepared. Sounds fun, thank you. All right, colleagues, this is a first reading. Uh, from an honor. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've all said our closing remarks. So would you entertain a motion for an emergency clause? Us, uh, make the motion, Commissioner. So moved. Commissioner Hardesty moves to add an emergency clause and the uh, stated since legal counsel will ask me to clarify this, the stated purpose of- uh, The stated purpose is uh, because um, uh, I think we've all said everything we need to say on, a re on this report. And isn't this a report? Uh, no, this is an ordinance. This is uh, accepting the uh, five-year uh, agreement with Travel Portland. Uh, putting an emergency clause on it will allow Jeff Miller to get to work faster. And uh, the emergency created by the pandemic, I agree with you, Commissioner Hardesty, creates an economic hardship for the city that is of urgency. You are correct. I'll second it. As a result, any further discussion? Please call the roll on the amendment. Brian. And we get to vote in front of Jeff in person. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. The main motion is amended. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Max. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted as amended. Thank you, Jeff and team. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Thank you so much. All right, our next item is ah right to the regular agenda item 357 please here you need 352 uh hang on you're right i'm sorry time certain uh 352 Authorize execution of an amended and restated agreement with Sport Oregon for national and international sports marketing activities and event recruiting services to extend contract by five years, not to exceed $275,000 over five years. Our colleagues, Carl Lyle, the City of Portland Spectator Venues Program Manager, and Jim Etzel, CEO of Sport Oregon, formerly named Oregon Sports Authority, are here to present this contract amendment to the city council. Sport Oregon works tirelessly to attract signature national and international sporting events to our city, providing exciting entertainment options, helping to raise the city's profile and supporting our local economy. The events Sport Oregon brings to Portland also generate city revenue through increasing the number of hotel rooms booked by major event attendees and generating user fees for events at the Rose Quarter, as well as at Providence Park. Welcome, Carl and Jim. Thank you for being here. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Carl Lyle, uh, City uh, Spectator Venues Program Manager. So uh, we uh, decided to bring this item along with the previous item because they're obviously related. Uh, this is a much smaller piece of the sort of overall travel and tourism uh, um, pie uh, in, in the region and the city, but uh, they are related and they serve many of the same uh, benefits uh, to the city. So um, this ordinance specifically authorizes the mayor or chief administrative officer to sign an amendment to the city's existing agreement with Sport Oregon for sports marketing and promotional services. Um, this is the first reading on a regular ordinance and we'll pass to second reading uh, next week unless amendments are made like we saw in the last um, <laughs> item. Uh, this amendment extends the term of the agreement by five years uh, and increases the annual payment we make to Sport Oregon by $5,000 per year to a total of $55,000 per year to keep up with consumer price index essentially. Uh, the funding for this agreement comes uh, from the city's spectator venues and visitor activities fund 
Uh, that fund's primary source of revenue are uh, from events and parking related to events at the Rose Quarter um, arenas, the Moda Center, Veterans Memorial Coliseum, and Providence Park. Um, so the Spectator Venues program benefits directly from the marketing and promotional activities provided by Sport Oregon uh, when events are attracted to our venues. Uh, makes sense. Um, the program and the city's general fund also benefits from sports events attracted to these and other venues in the city by the additional transient lodging taxes, which we just discussed in the previous item, uh, and but gen that are generated by people traveling to attend uh, sporting events in our city. And of course, the city broad benefits more broadly uh, from the, econo the broader economic impacts associated with large um, sporting events, large and small sporting events. Um, so to ensure the effectiveness of this agreement, Sport Oregon will continue to present annual reports to city council, uh, including reporting on a series of performance measures that are described in, I think it's section G of the agreement. Uh, the measures include reporting on geographic representation, sort of uh, who's benefiting across the city from Sport Oregon events and who's participating in them, uh, as well as reporting on Sport Oregon's uh, progress on um, made on achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion goals within the organization. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Jim Metzl to very briefly discuss Sport Oregon's activities that are supported by this agreement and what they have currently going on. And then I'm happy to answer uh, technical questions about the contract after that. Thank you, uh, Carl, and good morning, Mayor Wheeler and esteemed commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, visit with you today. Um, as you recall, about 60 days ago, I appeared before you and gave you our uh, annual report. So I won't go through that type of detail. But I do want to really uh, emphasize the value of this partnership uh, between the city and Sport Oregon. Uh, together, you know, we've been dedicated to driving a, a thriving sports tourism environment here, uh, which is a crucial component uh, for our city. Uh, we collectively have an unapologetic love for our city uh, and, and our state, and we want to share it with the world. That's always our uh, mission. Um, and it's, you know, Portland and our surrounding area, uh, along with the city sports organizations and tourism uh, and hospitality community, uh, we're eager to, sh to share our community to host events and teams, fans, et cetera, here. Uh, and we've been doing this for nearly three decades. I want to touch on, on uh, a couple slides here with some things that we've been uh, continuing to work on uh, and a few updates since I gave our annual report. Uh, the first is uh, around, uh, is this, are the slides moving through here? No. I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing a cover slide still. So. Oh, right. right. Hold on, we have a little technical difficulty. Here we go. All right. This was the slide I just spoke to. Spoke to. So uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, there are several things that uh, we've stepped up to. Uh, one is a partnership uh, with Partners in Diversity. Um, I represent uh, the sports community uh, on their leadership council. Uh, we also were a very active uh, sponsor of the North, the recent Northwest Equity. Uh, which had over 2,000 participants on it uh, about two weeks ago uh, and was a really uh, compelling and valued program. Uh, Community-based initiatives, we continue to drive with our foundation, uh, Fuel the Future, which uh, along with Hopscotch Foundation uh, addresses uh, food insecurity in our communities, uh, specifically at 12 uh, middle school and high schools. Um, and uh, food insecurity is a key barrier to uh, kid, kids or children uh, being physically active. Uh, and this is a highly successful program. We uh, succeeded in, in our first ever fundraiser in December in generating $256,000 for that. Uh, we just launched three weeks ago, She Flies, which is an initiative around girls and women, uh, specifically girls in underserved communities, getting them physically active, getting more community members connected with them. Uh, and uh, it's an exciting uh program platform that we uh, are going to grow significantly in the coming year and years. Uh, we also are actively supporting the launch of the new uh, Portland Activities and Athletic League and uh, are continuing to support uh, Portland nonprofits reaching underserved youth communities with uh, grants and other forms of support. 
uh, specifically to our board, uh, we just completed a overhaul of our bylaws, but over the last 12 months, those bylaw overhaul really focused on creating new directors categories specifically for uh, community directors and ex officio directors are, as you know, we're a member funded organization, uh, about 150 corporations and individuals uh, support us annually to drive our mission. Um, but we really needed to address uh, more diversity and perspective on our board. So I'm very proud to say over the last 12 months, we've either already onboarded or will be onboarding uh, 12 um, BIPOC members in our community to uh, both from the corporate community as, mem as uh, general directors, but also as community directors and ex officio directors to bring the voices and perspectives that we need to have at our board level to you know, guide our organization moving forward. We also uh, have been very uh, involved in uh, DEI work inside our four walls uh, for about 15 months now. Uh, very intense. Our, 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 I'm proud to say our team has taken this very seriously. We've also been working with uh, one of our board members, Tila Foxworth, and Foxworth facilitations on DEI training, and that continues uh, and will continue uh, each year, it will be an annual deal. It's not just a one and done type mentality we have with that. And also our hiring practices. And I'm exciting, excited to tell you that uh, our next hire uh, is a BIPOC candidate uh, that we're very excited about the um, things that he's gonna bring to our organization uh, in, in, at many levels. Um, next, I'd like to talk about Travel Portland um, and our uh, partnership with them. We are very, very connected with them, um, more connected than ever. Uh, and uh, we, they have strong presence on our board as well. Uh, Megan Conway is on our executive board. James Jesse is on our, uh, was one of our general directors. Uh, we work with them, our team, Matt Reed, our director of sports tourism, and myself and other team members work with them on a daily basis. Uh, and now, as Jeff touched on in his report prior to mine, uh, with the TID, uh, the hotel community uh, has uh, recognized uh, the opportunity to exist to really put our community on more equal footing uh, with our uh, peers around the country to uh, have more success uh, uh, with recruiting events at every level uh, to our city. Uh, and our board is completely committed to that. And it's uh, a three to four uh, multiple investment uh, that we're making uh, beginning here July 1st. So very excited and, uh, and think that the results will show uh, with that. Uh, next, I'd like to just touch on a few other things before I close um, around city recovery. Um, we have been active uh, to try to be um, on the front foot with this and arm in arm with other community members. Um, we are actively participating in the action tables uh, and uh, there's currently a subgroup being formed on that with all the sports organizations in town. Uh, think the franchises and universities, et cetera, and some of the bigger events that uh, we can hone in on things that uh, will help with that recovery. Uh, today, as we speak, uh, doors and inside our door to tease a big win. Unfortunately, we aren't going to be able to announce it uh, to the industry yet until October. But we found out last week uh, that this has been a two-year pursuit, that we are winning our industry conference uh, in 2024. Um, we see this as an exponential opportunity, not just for 2024, but for a decade beyond. This is a once in two decade opportunity to host. It'll be a 5,000 room night impact and, and take up half the convention center, but it brings all of the national governing bodies and the events rights holders to our community. And we can host them here for five days. Uh, and to get people to the West Coast when most of those rights holders are on the other side of the Rockies, it's a big deal. And we have some uh, really exciting, innovative programs to put shoulders on this event with familiarization tours in our community before and afterwards with Travel Portland. Uh, but this, uh, this is something we've wanted for a long time. So uh, we're excited and, and as Jeff Miller will attest, uh, it is the first win in the COVID era for a big new event committing to the city and not one that is being rescheduled. Uh, so happy to report that. Uh, we're also actively working on a couple owned event 
uh, opportunities, um, working with the hotel communities, identifying moments or, or calendar windows that are historically slow, that we can uh, fill that demand in those areas with predictable annual events that are owned by us or our community partners. <clears throat> the other one is we're putting acute focus on taking what we already have and how do we leverage that? Because there is definitely growth capacity and sometimes we're always looking for what's new and sometimes it's important to step back and look at what we already have and how do we strengthen that and maximize those opportunities. So we're very active with event partners around the city uh, on trying to uh, find growth, build growth uh, into those events uh, this year and in next. Um, that is the summary uh, that I have for you today. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you and uh, I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Very good, colleagues, any questions? Commissioner Hardesty has a question. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Jim, I just wanna say how impressed I am with how different your plan around equity, inclusion, and diversity is in this report. Um, uh, it looks, it, it appears uh, that the organization is really doing a deep dive. I am really impressed that you're bringing on 12 BIPOC people rather than one to represent an entire community. Um, and so it's clear to me that you've done some really deep dive thought, thoughtful analysis since the last time you've been in front of the council. And so I just want to applaud that. Um, and encourage you to continue to be very intentional um, uh, with uh, hires and uh, board members and perspectives. Um, uh, and I will say, you know, um, uh, no community is monolithic. So you, you know, at, whenever you talk to diverse communities, you will still get diverse opinions. And uh, I just wanted to take a moment to applaud you because I hear a lot of people talk about the changes that they're going to make and yours are really going to change your institution in a way that I hope will benefit Portlanders for a long time to come. Um, so I just want you to know I'm paying attention. I, I, we've had this conversation a couple of times and for the first time I feel like there's a serious plan and commitment. Um, I also would encourage you to think about how that plays out in the sports that you are inviting to town as well and how welcome people feel coming to participate in a variety of different sporting events. Um, we got a lot of work to do, but I am so impressed with where we are at the moment. So thank you. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate your recognition of that. We do have um, an internal goal that uh, looking out a year from now that we could say that we have the most diverse board in our community. Uh, for an organization that represents the entire community is not a nonprofit, spe you know, specifically serving a BIPOC community. And I think uh, it's a very attainable goal. I think our organization has always had great intent, especially through our foundation, but the intentional formation of what the community needed wasn't informed enough. And we really, as a board, recognize that and leadership and uh, address that. Yes, uh, it is clear. Yeah, because uh, it's had not been reflected so clearly up until today. Um, and I did have a question and I think that question just went out of my head. I'm old and they come and go very quickly. Um, if I think of I'm it, before you leave, I will ask. But again, thank you. It is clear that you are on a path um, that I hope other nonprofits will emulate uh, because um, you know it's 2021 and we can't keep talking about diversity. We got to actually do it. So thank you so much for setting it a fine example of what's possible Thank you. when you're intentional. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio, then Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, hi, Jim. I just wanted to also echo my um, my colleague and just appreciating the presentation. I, I, I wasn't around for the last one, but it, it's very clear that um, you're being very intentional and thoughtful about this work. And it really does start with the board. You know, the board sets the leadership direction and the strategic vision and and really um, is charged with looking like the communities that we serve. So I, I applaud you um, taking those those big steps. Those are, that, that demonstrates um, a strong commitment. My question is about, and you mentioned the foundation work. Can you talk a little bit about 
um, what your foundation work currently does, and then also how do you how um, what do you envision how the 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 new um, changes to the board? How will that uh, what impact will that have in your foundation work specifically? I'm just curious. Yes, good question. So um, our foundation, our mission of our foundation is to. Uh, primary mission is to uh, address barriers to physical activity for underserved youth communities. Um, so that's a pretty broad um, deal. Uh, and it's not just our city, but statewide. But since a bulk of our funding and presence and opportunity exists in Portland metro area, it is definitely strongly weighted at probably 85% uh, plus in, in Portland. Um, <clears throat> we really have only a couple but I would call proprietary internal programs that we do in a community. One which started about seven years ago, the Track Town Youth League, which is going to get renamed uh, the Sport Oregon uh, Track Youth Series here this next year. Uh, and we uh, really target that. It's a low barrier entry sport. It's a sport that is part of our DNA of the state. It's one that we can really own uniquely. And there really isn't... Um, there are several groups like Albina, Roadrunners, et cetera, that have done this for a long time, but we, we really extended it to a broader community across the state. We held 17 meets across the state. Uh, four of those were in the Portland metro area. Uh, primarily, we have tried to leverage our strength in numbers and corporate support in that we have 150 members. So how do we collectively pull that energy together to elevate and amplify the good work being done in the community? Um, and that is with grants, uh, where we can hold fundraisers, leverage our abilities and access, and then turn around and take those funds and inject them in the community. But we haven't been real active in that. We've always had a couple of handfuls of grants a year. With uh, Last year, we launched the Fuel of Future, which is our very first, what is going to be an annual fundraiser. Uh, we think we can double the number we raised in that uh, last year. And then also She Flies. And those those platforms are gonna generate funds that we can incrementally increase uh, our work with the community. As far as the board seats, the community board seats, there's up to 12 community board seats that we can have in our bylaws. And we'll probably fill those immediately by the end of this year. Uh, <clears throat> and we've already taken steps to, literally two weeks ago, the bylaws got passed. So we're moving on this right now. But of those uh, community boards or board members, they, a lot of them will come from the nonprofit community, um, and, uh, and that's where that thought leadership is. Identifying needs. Some are already uh, organizations that benefit from our support, um, and we have conflict of interest language around all that stuff because uh, we want to be careful that it's not perceived that all guidance goes to those board representatives from the community. But they, the great thing about our community is those, those leaders really work together. I mean, there's just a collaborative approach, especially in the underserved community about, because uh, they all face the same challenges. And so that's uh, <laughs> where we're coming at it from that angle. Did I answer the, all the aspects of your question? Because there was an audio breakup and I might have missed something. Thank you. Very good, Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Jim. Good to see you. Um, and actually, I want to start off by acknowledging you, Carl. You're the glue here today. And uh, I meant to mention your name earlier, but I really want to acknowledge your service as the connector with the, the organizations that we're um, excited to have dialogue with today. So thank you, uh, Carl. Um, the second point I wanted to make is um, that I really appreciate that you mentioned that you're part of the Adopt to Block program. So thank you for doing that. I know I had a chance to... Uh, play with you well for a few hours on Saturday with Solve. And it's um, it's a real eye opener and it really does feel good. And it was great to have uh, conversations with houseless residents and uh, <clears throat> see how they are so part of the solution um, when we were doing the cleanup work and the dialogue we have. And I hope that you're having an opportunity to get to know your houseless um, residents nearby as well. Um, I also wanted to make a comment on the transformation of the culture, which really does start at the board as Commissioner Rubio mentioned. I know I had a position similar where it's a, say, mainstream organization that represents all communities. And it was in 2008. And in two years, we really dramatically uh, changed the composite. And then I had a lot of people coming at me saying, you know, what's the secret sauce? And 
I'm sure you know this, it's about relationships. And so it took a lot of dialogue, a lot of outreach and a lot of listening. And I know you um, hold those values. So I want to acknowledge um, that you made this work front and center. And I appreciate that a lot. Um, I also think it's important to lift up the industry that you represent. I think sometimes people forget that all, all industries in our country have some horrific uh, history. And that's true with uh, sport as well, as we know, you know. But however, I think a lot of us, well, I can speak for myself, my lived experience was being active in sports was where you had an opportunity to build relationships with other communities and other cultures and unlike anything else. And so um, I think it's organic for the Oregon Sports Authority to be a leader on justice work with, um, with, with what, what the topic of the day is and DEI. It's uh, justice work, but you have deep roots in your industry. And I, I just give a lived experience over the last few years, my spouse isn't um, from a sports culture. Like I'm, I'm the youngest of eight, I have six older brothers. So, you know, sports was kind of in my DNA. And um, when I took them to a Blazer game, they were hesitant. And because they're Mexican and uh, in, in Native American uh, roots, they notice when we're in crowds that oftentimes no one looks like them. And they were surprised um, in a good way that when we attend sporting events, especially Blazer games, how multicultural and diverse the crowd is. And so I think a lot of people um, should just know that and that we need to lean into that. So um, anyway, good work. Here's an unfair question that I still want to ask you because for some reason I'm getting emails about it. Maybe I'm the only one since I talked about sports probably more than I should. Um, you have an opinion on um, this uh, fact that Oakland's looking to maybe move. And as, again, I said the unfair question of the day. No, no, it's not. And it's really relevant um, uh, as we sublease space uh, to a uh, Portland Diamond Project and uh, to say uh, they've been active over the last uh, month uh, is, is an understatement uh, or months. They've been working really hard to be positioned for a moment like this. At the end of the day, um, probably our biggest competitor is the city of Oakland. Um, uh, and and, and it, there's no painting it. This is a, the final leverage against, you know, on Oakland, the city to, to come to some sort of uh, I guess we need to work for system. everybody uh, down there. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, as long as there's no realignment within Major League Baseball, I think it's really a West Coast race. Um, the other cities on the in the Midwest and the East would would throw the alignment out. Um, we're working very hard to get the representatives up here in several weeks. Uh, there is a major uh, presentation that will be happening tomorrow. Uh, that is uh, not with the Oakland A's, but in general about site. Uh, so. They're very active uh, and, and uh, it, the, they've been also complimented because the city of Las Vegas has, they just like to make noise. And so uh, they have been um, very aggressive and open about their pursuit and their desire and why they should be it. Uh, while the Portland Diamond Project has been, um, I, I would say more strategic uh, and uh, it's being recognized not just by the Oakland A's, but Major League Baseball. And uh, a lot of times you just don't want all that stuff out in newspapers about the, the talk. And uh, so, um, yes, I, I was on a call last night where they were complimented on that. And, uh, you know, we'll see if, where this goes. Uh, we're also um, looking at some other opportunities franchise-wise for the city that would benefit city facilities that already exist too. So uh, deep in work of that. And you're right, sports unifies both on the field as participants and, and and, uh, but in the stands, um, I think when you look back on the last year and a half that we've all been through, you saw Sport Oregon fairly quiet on uh, BLM and, and these things because we felt like our, we, we if you peeled back, you know, took the, uh, the uh, curtain back, could, were we demonstrating that we were walking the talk and we weren't there yet. And uh, the only statement we made was when, uh, the incident in Kenosha happened in the NBA and Major League Soccer and all the sports stopped that night. Um, and uh, we just came out with a statement. It, it, you know, you can't just root in the stands for the athletes that represent your city if you're unwilling to listen to their voice off the field. 
And that's the only statement we really made. And uh, we just we just didn't feel like we were, it was our place. And uh, especially until we start demonstrating difference difference uh, of uh, how we can demonstrate the changes we made as organization as part of our community. Thank you, Jim. You have the heart and the head for this job and sports as a unifier for sure. On that note, maybe this is the uh, fair question and soft question. Um, do you have a prediction in the Blazer Nuggets series? Blazers. <laughs> Got to have the bias, hometown. Got to believe. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll say in six, so we have at least three games at home, which will be good for revenue. Yeah. Right? Okay, I, so. I say it's six as well. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Good. And Jim, thank you. Thank you for that answer to the last question, especially since your ordinance is still sitting on the table in front of the <laughs> city council. <laughs> that was wise, wise judgment. Uh, Keelan, do we have any public testimony on this item? No one signed up for this item. Very good. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you very much. Next item, uh, 353, please. Appoint members to the new Portlanders Policy Commission for terms to expire May 24th, 2024. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, I was muted and I caught myself. Um, thank you, Mayor. I am very happy to present to you today this list of very stellar community members who've agreed to serve in a capacity on the new Portlanders Commission. Um, Excuse me for a sec. I am pulling up my document. Um, I do believe, uh, Marco, are you here representing the Office of Civic Life for this presentation? Yes, I am. Come Excellent. Come. I will allow you to take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner uh, Hardesty, uh, the mayor, and all the commissioners and the council. Uh, uh, my name is Marco Mejia, and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Civic Lives Community and Neighborhood Involvement Center, and a member of the Immigrant and Refugee Program team. Uh, my role is also to staff and assist the new Portlanders Policy Commission with technical support, uh, substantive expertise advice, logistical and administrative assistance. Um, <clears throat> it is an honor to present uh, to you two MPPC members today who played a vital role on the selection committee. They committed 30 hours of exhaustive work in the process that led to select the nine applicants who will be presented to council uh, for their confirmation today. Uh, these members are Blanca Gaitan Farfan and Salome Nanyenga. They are presenting the MPPC and the selection process um, the committee embarked on. So let's um, welcome uh, Blanca Gaitan. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Blanca Aitan Farfan. I'm a member of the MPPC since 2019 and a part of the selection committee. Um, I'll be giving a short outline of the uh, immigrant refugee community here in Portland and background on the MPPC. Um, so in our community, um, we know that the immigrant refugee population in Portland has steadily grown in numbers and in, in diversity. Um, in, in the community, there are about every one in five um, neighbors speak different languages other than English and Portland and the overall metro area is home to nearly 70 immigrant and, and ethnic groups. That immigrants and refugees uh, often arrive to Portland full of enthusiasm and hope and with um, different aspirations of finding home and community as well as with a variety of lived experiences, needs and expectations. And our communities all seek to find a variety of, uh, to seek to feel welcome, safe and um, having access to a better life and greater opportunities for advancement and prosperity. Um, some key findings that uh, were compiled by the new American economy illustrate some of the contributions of the immigrant refugee community, including um, $4.2 billion paid in tax contributions across the state, um, about 26,140 immigrant refugee small business owners and entrepreneurs across the state as well, and 14.6% of the community of immigrant refugees are essential workers. And lastly, um, the community has a 
an 11 billion spending power um, dollar spending power across Oregon. Um, so the contributions of immigrant refugee communities in Oregon, and particularly in Portland, are overall um, are key to the overall economic and social development. And the New Portlanders Policy Commission was created to bring those voices to the city. So in May, May 2016, um, born out of um, earlier conversations with immigrant and refugee communities, um, the city of Portland established the new Portlanders Policy Commission. And the commission is composed of up to 25 voting members who are immigrant and refugee leaders and community advocates who work live, play, or pray in the city of Portland. And these community, um, uh, these commissioners are charged with supporting the city's equity initiatives um, by refining uh, and reviewing and refining past recommendations on um, immigrant and refugee community integration and policies and practices, developing policy uh, and practice recommendations for improving uh, immigrant and refugee community integration, providing uh, expert support and technical advice to city council and city bureaus and providing that expert support and technical advice to local partners such as schools, other uh, government entities, state and federal agencies in developing and implementing a comprehensive body of immigrant refugee policies and practices. Um, so that is a little bit of background and I'll now pass it off to Salome who will provide more information on the process. Thank you, Blanca. Um, good morning, Mayor Wheeler, um, commissioners, and all the guests. Uh, my name is Salome Nanyenga, a New Portlander Policy Commission member since um, 2019, and also a selection committee member. I would like to present a brief count of how the selection committee um, did its work. Last year, the New Portlander Policy Commissioner uh, membership was reduced by 15 since 10 of the members ended their regular term. By our bylaw, the commission assigned six of its members to comprise the selection committee. It was selected intentionally representing the diversity of our, of our commission. There were Evelyn Louis, Blanca Gaitan Falfan, Ahmed Auzubidi, Dr. Baha Buti, and myself, Salome Nanyenga. The process were as follows. First, we planned and set a timeline goal. We established the criteria to help us select the best who will respond to the new Portlander Policy Commission needs and roles, reviewed and designed the application based on CIRI standards for recruitment of public volunteer boards and commissions members. Then we opened the public recru recruitment through NeoGov. We intentionally also did extra outreach targeting groups communities and organizations composed and or working directly with immigrants and refugees in Portland. After the public recruit recruitment, we had 45 people who applied. The selection committee reviewed each applicant applications rigorously based on the selection criteria and we had three rounds of selection. We selected 24 candidates in the first round. Secondly, we selected 17 candidates in the second round who were also called for personal interviews. Then the third round was um, the final selection confirmed nine of the reviewed candidates this model for the selection process is also used by the Manoma Youth Commission. All this work was possible through 15 meetings and about 30 hours of work by selection committee. Through the advisory bodies program application, 
all applicants learned about the expectations, time commitment, and role of the new Portlanders Policy Commission and affirm their interest in saving by signing and submitting the application. And now I would like to present the council, the nine candidates selected, if appointed, they will become the new members of New Portlanders Policy Commission and bring its membership to 24. Here they are. Masara Ewaz Ramson. Victor Tran, Eric Ruiz, Nabin Himal, Mia Sabanovic, Jessica Max, Vania Lucio Masila, Rama Youssef, Hussein Ido. As a group, this candidate's representation will contribute to maintain the NPPC as one of the most diverse commission in the city of Portland. This candidate represent a diversity of countries of origin, languages, gender, sexual orientation, life experiences and professional expertise and more. The New Portlander Policy Commission through our mayor is recommending City Council to confirm these candidates to become our new commissioners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, it, it, thank you all, uh, the council. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, we're ready to and open to answer those. Colleagues, any questions? Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Could we stop screen sharing so we can see all your beautiful faces? Thank you. Um, first, let me just say what an incredible amount of time volunteers spent um, both recruiting candidates, um, doing personal interviews, um, and really being intentional about the skill sets that you were seeking. So I want to applaud the thoughtfulness under which you are moving these uh, candidates forward. That's number one. Number two, I want to ask the um, the prior board members who are vote, have voted off, do we have any um, um, exit interview information that would help us understand the challenges that new Portlanders face when asked to volunteer their time for such important work? Yeah, we, we do have uh, an interview, um, an exit interview, and also uh, if they don't want to have an interview, they fill up um, a document uh, now exiting out. Uh, I think that one of the major um, difficulties that our commissioners have is uh, the time to, to serve in the commission because it requires time and effort, as you can see in this process. And uh, one of the things that have always come up uh, and also actually a council is dealing with in it's that uh, at some point we are able to compensate for the time that those volunteers uh, put into the into the work. I think that that's one of the major ones that difficulties for them because you know many have kids, they have two three jobs, etc. And it's, it's good to understand that you know all of the people that come to serve uh, in these commissions uh, are citizens of this city that are, are very committed also in their own personal and political and social lives too. Uh, thank you so much for that, Marco. Um, you know, a lot of times I ask questions I already know the answer to, um, but I asked you that question specifically because we've talked about doing a pilot project, and I've heard that from New Portlander committee members since we put that committee together, and so I would support a pilot with the New Portlanders Commission about what that could look like citywide. You may know civic life is actually responsible for coming back to the council with some recommendations, uh, but it's a very complicated process. So uh, it is my hope that if the council desires to put in a pilot project on community engagement, that we would use New Portlanders Commission as our pilot because of the years that we've had to struggle 
to actually support our immigrant and refugee communities voice being included in city policy deliberations. So, um, you know, some, you know, Marco, I couldn't have written your script better because you said exactly what I would have said if I had tried, if I had answered it myself. Um, excellent work, fabulous candidates. Uh, thank you so much for what you do and for the intentionality you bring uh, to your work uh, with us at the city of Portland. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Colleagues, any further questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. May I move we accept the report as presented? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, that we appoint uh, the uh, 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 the members of the new Portlander Committee as presented. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty moves the report. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Commissioner Ryan seconds. Any further discussion? Keelan, please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, uh, thank you. So this is a great um, group of people. Thank you for bringing it forward. I did have the privilege of gathering with the members of NPCC about, I think it was about two weeks ago, and listen and learn from all of you about your issues and your agenda uh, and that, that what you need support and advocacy for. Um, I'm really looking forward to engaging with the new members in future conversations and learning from them as well. And really just thank you so much uh, for your commitment uh, to the new Portlanders Policy Commission. That was a terrific report, by the way. It was great to once again um, quantify uh, what 11 billion in spending, um, the emerging markets power um, in, in our market. And uh, I just really wanna thank you again for your dedication to the community and for helping us highlight the voices of our immigrant and refugee Portlanders. And thank goodness you moved here and we're excited to work with you. Welcome, hi. Hardesty. Um, thank you, Marco, for the fabulous work of staff and civic life to bring these fabulous candidates forward to us. Um, thank you, Bianca and uh, Solomon, uh, for your incredible work and in leading uh, to this great list of candidates. Um, they are impressive, and I know they will add value uh, to the work of the commission. I'm very happy to vote aye. Oops. Um I'd also like to thank Marco for his work uh, with this commission, and I'd like to thank all the new commissioners for volunteering our, uh, their time uh, to this very important work. I vote uh Rubio. I want to thank the current members um, and also Commissioner Hardesty and also the staff of Civic Life for recommending these candidates uh, to the commission. Um, I'm very impressed uh, with the experience and the perspective that you all bring, and I'm really eager to engage more closely with the work of the council. Um, I had uh, the great privilege to work closely with so many immigrant and refugee families during my time in nonprofit work. And when you come from an immigrant family or work within or alongside these communities, you have a deeper appreciation of the incredible contribution and wisdom that resides within these communities. And at the same time, you can never unsee the lack of cultural responsiveness in systems of government and the need for advocacy in commissions like this. Um, and historically in the state and country, we've had to advocate for, for government to more fully recognize the experiences and contributions, and even the humanity of immigrants and refugees in our community and address challenges and barriers to full participation in work, in civic and community life. And it may seem like a very basic thing to ask for, but, be, but people may seem you know, surprised how certain actions or inactions by institutions can strip away immigrant and refugee humanity. And we have countless examples of this over time and also very recently, um, but we have the ability and, and the responsibility uh, together to eliminate those barriers. So um, this commission has a very essential role in ensuring voices and experiences and needs are elevated. And um, I applaud your commitment uh, to stepping into this service because we know there's still a lot of work to do as we move into, co into recovery from COVID and all of those economic impacts. So your voices and perspectives are needed more than ever. So congratulations and I vote aye. Wheeler. Portland has had a strong record, particularly in recent years around both welcoming, protecting, and enhancing and being responsive to the needs of our immigrant refugee community. And 
I want to thank this commission in particular for its important work over the last three to four years. You will recall there was a time when the very institution of immigration was under fire in this country. And I was very proud of the fact as mayor that Portland took a leadership role in championing and supporting the cause of immigration. And we made ourselves a, a very intentional leader in that movement. And it was this commission that helped us to really formulate and express that leadership position and the importance of it. And not only the value of immigration, but also the imperative of immigration as being central to our society and central to the needs of our community. And so the work that this commission does is not only very important, it is, uh, as I would say, essential to the work that this city needs to do. And so we have a good record in the city of Portland, but we need to have a better record. We're doing a lot, but nobody's doing enough is probably how I would describe it. This is a great panel. Commissioner Hardesty, thank you to the Office of Civic Life. Thank you for bringing a great panel forward, but most importantly, thank you. I know everybody's busy. There's a lot going on in our community right now. And frankly, there's a lot of healing that needs to happen and there's a lot of trauma. And this commission will help us navigate both the trauma and the healing process yet to come. Uh, so it's, it's a big job. And I'm just really glad that we have such knowledgeable and experienced people being willing to uh, engage with their time and their talent and their energy. And uh, I appreciate it. I just personally appreciate it, not just as mayor, but as somebody who lives here and loves the city. Uh, I'm really grateful to you. My hat's off to you. Thank you. Um, this is an easy vote. I vote aye. The report is accepted. The appointments are approved. And I really do hope you'll reach out to all of us and to others in the city and let us know how can we be helpful to you being successful in your mission. This is a partnership and we want you to be successful uh, as you work, frankly, to make our whole community successful. So thank you. I vote aye. The report's accepted. The, uh, the appointments are all approved. Thank you. Next up, we're moving to the regular agenda 357, please. Proclaim May 2021 to be Portland Nurses Month. Whether in an everyday emergency, on a battlefield, or in a pandemic, nurses always find themselves on the front line of providing healing and care to all who need it. Nurses are an essential part of our healthcare system, providing patient-centered care in all fields of medicine. Nurses provide not only medical care, but they often provide significant emotional support during challenging moments. And some instances are present during a dying patient's final moments. This has proven especially true as hundreds of thousands of Americans and millions worldwide have lost their lives from COVID-19. Nurses, along with other healthcare workers, have played an essential role during the pandemic, putting their lives on the line to provide better outcomes for patients with COVID-19. Unfortunately, the incredible work of nurses and other healthcare workers during the pandemic has led to high instances of burnout and stress. In a survey conducted late last year, 93% of healthcare workers reported experiencing stress. 86% reported experiencing anxiety. 77% reported frustration. 76% reported exhaustion and burnout. And 75% said they were overwhelmed. More than ever, nurses need to know that they're respected, that they are valued, and that they are celebrated. Nurses were essential before the pandemic and they're especially essential now. We can't take for granted the crucial role that they perform in our healthcare system and indeed in our entire community. 
To all nurses, I want to say thank you. We salute you. Before I read this proclamation, I wonder if any of my colleagues have any comments that they'd like to share. Commissioner Hardesty and then Commissioner Maps. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have always been a champion of nurses, but this last year with COVID has taught us something I think we don't, I, I hope we don't forget. Is that in crisis, nurses are always on the front line and they put their own health at risk. They put the risk of their, fam their family's health at risk um, and they do it because they have to, because they have taken an oath to actually serve people uh, who are in need. Um, I got to tell you, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was it felt overwhelming just watching what was happening all over the country. Um, and um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the nurses who each and every day get up, go do an incredibly thankless job, but yet are vital uh, to the health and well-being of so many people in our community. I um, want you to know I see you. I see you daily. And on a personal note, I know when I had a loved one that was suffering from cancer, though the doctor did the surgery and the doctor did the follow-up, it was the nurses that helped the survival and uh, recovery from what was a major life-threatening illness. So my hat's off to nurses, not just today, but every single day of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Maps, then Rubio, then Ryan. Uh, Mr. Mayor, colleagues, I am delighted to join you today in declaring March Portland uh, Nurses Month. Um, and let me share you, with you uh, one of the many reasons why. Last Sunday, I got my second COVID shot at the Oregon Convention Center. It's been a couple of days and I feel great, but I'll tell you the truth, I still have um, a dull ache in my arm and I kind of like it. It's a souvenir which reminds me of the person who brought me to the beginning of the end of my personal COVID journey. And of course, she was a nurse, a nurse who jabbed me so expertly, I wasn't even sure she actually gave me the shot. Uh, but a couple of hours later, I could feel the vaccine do its work. So I know that I'm at the beginning of the end of my personal COVID journey. I will never forget the chaos that COVID has caused in my life and the lives of every other human being on this planet. And I will always remember that it was a nurse who helped bring that to an end. And I'm not alone. As of today, more than uh, 450,000 people in Loma County have received at least one COVID shot. That's about 65% of Portlanders above the age of 16. Uh, I think Portlanders haven't fully processed how huge this milestone is. Uh, the Rose City is about 10 days away from beginning the end of our COVID nightmare. By the end of this month, Portlanders should be able to eat in restaurants again, meet a friend for a movie, go to a concert and send our kids to summer camps and play dates. Um, we have nurses to thank for that. Um, now, of course, uh, um, as Portland reopens, there will be setbacks, but there is no turning back. Portland's recovery from COVID has begun and we have nurses to thank for that. We are so close to a new, better post-COVID world. And again, we have nurses to thank for that. Um, that's why I'm asking every Portlander to join in this council in celebrating May as uh, Portland's Nurses Month. And if you really want to show your respect for nurses, please consider this suggestion. If you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, please go get your shots. I highly recommend the vaccination station at the Portland Convention Center. They take in walk in, they take walk-ins and are a model of efficiency, uh, literally the best vaccination station in the nation. In fact, my 12-year-old is going to go get his first uh, COVID shot later today at the uh, Convention Center. And when we go, uh, um, we will certainly remember to thank the nurse uh, um, who um, injects my child. And I hope that you will all remember to celebrate March as Portland's Nurses Month. 
Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Rubio, then Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor, uh, for bringing this procl proclamation forward today. Um, the crucial role of nurses in our healthcare system has become so deeply apparent in the last uh, four, 14 months. And nurses everywhere have literally put their lives on the front line and, and risk the impacts on their own families. And too many have lost their lives in some cases um, to ensure that our residents have the best chance to return to full health. Um, nurses have also personally made a difference in my life in helping with the care and aid of one of my own uh, parents in this time where we had to coordinate for care for my father that required, um, you know, the knitting together of, of his uh, care plan between his providers in Texas and in Oregon during COVID. And it, it was nurses that did this uh, when they didn't have to and because this is what their care looks like. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, these are essential workers that bring a quality of care, expertise, and, um, and deep, deep love for the well-being of all patients. And for these reasons, um, I want to personally thank them um, in the Portland metro region and, all, and actually around the world for their work and for their sacrifice and for the kindness and love that they show all of us. I, I vote aye. Or it's not a vote, is it? It's a proclamation. Never mind. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ryan? Thank you, Mayor. I want to just start off by, first of all, acknowledging all the great comments of my colleagues. There's a reason why we're taking a breath and giving some attention to nurses today more than ever. Um, I just want to, I was reflecting a little bit on history and in my own family, my aunt um, was a public nurse and I'm old enough where if you go a generation above me, it, fem women and females really had two professions that they could excel in. It was nursing and teaching. And so for some reason in my family, we had nurses. Anyway, she was a public health nurse in San Jose. And she had so much insight. I remember as a little kid, she would just nail what was really happening in the world because she saw things in such a direct, raw way. Um, there was no filter. She just had to receive whoever showed up in the public hospital in San Jose. She even warned me um, later on when I was a teenager about the houselessness crisis coming someday if we don't get it right. So nurses just see everything. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, my own journey. Uh, and I'll never forget when I was in the hospital a lot in 95, 96, it was always like nurses that were the ones that I would rally with me to help me get out of there. And uh, so, you know, my respect for nurses is deep. And I'll just end with um, the last year, especially I have two friends that work in emergency ER. And uh, they really give me so much insight about the types of the increase in the amount of mental health episodes that are spiking in our community, especially during COVID, and especially from our houseless uh, residents. And a reminder how our state is just so inadequate in terms of a mental health system and where we can receive treatment. And this is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I'm kind of tying this together with nurses. Thank you for being on the front lines. Thank you for continuing to show up to work. Um, you definitely don't get paid enough. And we are um, all here to acknowledge you at this moment in time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. And with that, on behalf of the entire Portland City Council, I will read a proclamation. Whereas registered nurses in the United States constitute our nation's largest healthcare profession, and whereas the depth and breadth of the registered nursing profession meets the different and emergency healthcare needs of the American population in a wide range of settings. And whereas the American Nurses Association is the voice for registered nurses in this country is working to chart a new course for a healthy nation that relies on increasing access to primary and preventative health care. And whereas a renewed emphasis on primary and preventative health care will require better, better utilization of all of our nation's registered nursing resources. And whereas Professional nursing is an indispensable component of the safety and quality of care of hospitalized patients. And whereas the demand for registered nursing services will be greater than ever because of the aging of the American population, the continuing expansion of life sustaining technologies and the explosive growth of home health care services. And whereas more 
qualified registered nurses are needed in the future to meet the increasingly complex needs of healthcare consumers in this community. And whereas the cost effective, safe, and high quality healthcare services provided by registered nurses will be an increasingly important component of the United States healthcare delivery system in the years ahead. And whereas, along with the American Nurses Association, Oregon Science and Health University has declared May 6th as National RN Recognition Day and the month of May as Nurses Month with the theme, You Make a Difference, a nod to nurses' sheer numbers, their unparalleled impact during the pandemic and healthcare, and an open invitation to hashtag thank a nurse for enriching our lives and the world in which we live. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, the mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon, the city of Roses, do hereby proclaim May 2021 to be Portland Nurses Month in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Thank you. Next up, Keelan, is item number 358. Accept bid of Stellar J Corporation for the Ankeny Pump Station Odor Treatment System Rehab Project for $1,530,000. Colleagues, this is a procurement report for Bureau of Environmental Services project to repair the Ankeny Pump Station Odor Treatment System located in Waterfront Park. The equipment and control system was damaged by a flood in 2015, rendering the facility out of service. Chief Procurement Officer Kathleen Brennis Marua is here to present this report. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, I'm Kathleen Brennis Marua, Chief Procurement Officer, and I am here to recommend authorization to enter into a contract with Stellar J Corporation for the Ankeny Pump Station Odor Treatment System Rehab Project. On February 3rd, Council authorized procurement services to solicit the project with an engineer's estimate of 1.2 million. And at that time, the confidence level was high. Procurement services issued an invitation to bid on February 24th, and we received two bids on April 6th. The bid of Stellar J Corporation was determined to be the lowest responsive bid in the, amend, in the amount of 1,530,000. The city's aspirational 20% subcontractor and supplier utilization goal applied. Stellar J has committed to subcontract 20.04% to firms certified by the state's certification office for business inclusion and diversity. They are self-performing nearly 70% of the work and subcontracting the remaining 11% to non-certified firms. Stellar J Corporation is in full compliance with all city contracting requirements, and I here recommend that Council accept this report and authorize execution of the contract. I'm happy to answer any questions about the procurement process. Paul Sudo, Chief Engineer with Environmental Services, is also here this morning and can answer any questions about the project itself. Colleagues, any questions on this item? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, just real quick. Um, thank you, Kathleen. It's always good to see you. When it says, where'd it go? That the confidence level was high, uh, the, the confidence of the cost of this project was high. Can you then explain the factors resulting in the overestimation? I will ask Paul Sudo um, to respond to that question, Paul. And we may have lost him. Keelan? Hi, this is Huli. I'm a project manager for this project. Um, Paul probably, you know, tie up in another meeting. So um, the, um, the estimate was um, at 100% and the level of estimate was high. However, when we bid the project, the locations of the project and the conditions that we need to meet um, for the safety of the pedestrian 
um, that require by park does add on a level of um, safety. And we believe that was the reason that the bid was higher. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Anytime it's over 25%, I'm just always curious what the conditions were and the factors. And it sounds like you explained that it was around safety concerns for pedestrians. I appreciate that. Thank you. Very good. I'll obtain a motion. Um, Mr. Mayor, I move that we um, pass this ordinance. That's the right language. Commissioner Maps moves the report. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Marticy. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The report's accepted. Item 359, please. Authorize a borrowing of not more than $60,470,000 in anticipation of the Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Fund Levy for FY 2021-22. Colleagues, this ordinance authorizes the borrowing of $60,470,000 in anticipation of the Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Fund Levy for fiscal year 21-22. This borrowing is a result of a cash flow deficit created due to the timing of property tax collection, which will begin in November of 2021. The city will repay the principal and interest on the notes no later than 6-30-22. Debt manager Matt Gerock is here to present the ordinance. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. For the record, um, I'm Matt Gierach, the city's debt manager. I'm also joined by Stacy Jones, deputy director with FPDNR. This ordinance authorizes the annual short-term borrowing related to the city's fire and police disability retirement fund, also referred to as FPDNR. FPDNR is funded on an annual basis through a dedicated property tax levy, which is sized to pay the fund's current year requirements. Given that the city's first property tax collections are not received until mid-November, this creates a recurring temporary funding gap during the first four months of each fiscal year. To address the temporary funding shortfall, each year the city enters into a short-term borrowing to provide interim financial resources to the FPDNR fund. With repayment occurring later in the year once sufficient financial resources are available. Simply put, the borrowing solves for a timing mismatch of annual revenues and expenditures. By enacting this ordinance, the city will be authorized to issue up to 60 million of short-term debt specifically for this purpose. With your authorization, we expect to enter into the borrowing on behalf of FPDNR as early as July 7th. Currently, our estimated interest rate for this borrowing is roughly 0.4%, uh, though this will vary depending on market conditions and actual financing costs. Again, this is a routine financing for the city and I'm happy to answer any questions on the borrowing. And again, Stacey Jones is here to answer any uh, specific questions at PDNR. Colleagues, any questions on this matter? Are there any, uh, is there any testimony on this item, Keelan? Yes, Mayor, we have one person signed up. All right, three minutes name for the record, please. First up, we have Edith Gillis. Hello, my name is Edith Gillis. I'd like you to separate the amount of set aside for the fire, disability, and, <clears throat> and retirement from the police. Prevent cops from hurting the economy, the people, the um, economy, and um, people's ability and willingness to pay the taxes and to um, lend the money. Increase the tax collection of fines from the wealthy. Find Zenith um, and others who are costing us so much more and will cause widespread disability, early retirement, and death. Require cops to be fit, um, rested, um, and healthy before being hired and before going on each shift. Allowing them out on the streets, promoted, or in management positions. Ban the use of steroids when not medically necessary. And uh, do frequent surprise neutral third person drug testing to prevent police from getting um, disabled or disabling others. You know, these, these, are all, these are all interesting ideas. 
Um, this and is ways in which you can reduce the amount of money. Completely unrelated to what is before us. This is a question about gap funding for the fire and police retirement program. And if, if you have comments on other matters, this is not the time to express that. Do you have any comments on this particular ordinance? And if, if not, we're gonna move on. All right, colleagues, any further questions on this ordinance? This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance that moves to second reading. Next item, 360, second reading. Amend permit fee schedules for building, electrical, land use services, mechanical, enforcement, plumbing, signs, site development, and land use services fee schedule for the hearings office. Colleagues, this is a second reading. We've heard a presentation. There's been opportunity for public testimony and the further discussion. Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, uh, the Bureau of Development Services is truly the project management bureau for the permitting process. And as a fee for service bureau, fee increases are the only sustainable option for cost recovery and for the bureau to continue operating at a level that is helpful to homeowners, renters, landlords, developers, affordable housing advocates, and builders. I really value the BDS team and the Infrastructure Bureau partners for the steps we are taking to improve the permitting process and user experience. And I just want to highlight their one focus goal is to improve the quality of submittals. I vote aye. Artisty. Uh, uh, this is one bureau that everybody in the city of Portland has an opinion about. Um, and it is my hope um, as we continue to monitor uh, the recovery from COVID-19 that in fact uh, these uh, fee increases are not impediments uh, to affordable housing and other low income business opportunities. Um, we will continue to monitor it. We don't know. We don't know what we don't know yet. Um, and I will put faith in the commissioner in charge, Commissioner Ryan, uh, to keep us updated on whether or not we are having a, unintended consequences from this action. Um, but today, I will vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Ryan and the BDS staff um, for your work on this, um, especially during these uh, challenging times. Um, I'm supportive of these efforts um, it, because uh, it, in the hopes of avoiding layoffs and keeping um, our services continuing. Um, and I also just want to appreciate um, uh, the engagement with impacted organizations prior to rolling this out. I vote aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 361, please. Authorize the Bureau of Transportation to acquire certain permanent and temporary rights necessary for construction of the Pedestrian Safety Improvements Americans with Disabilities Act Accessible Sidewalks Project through the exercise of the city's eminent domain authority. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. We have before us an ordinance to allow some key pedestrian safety improvements as part of our American Disabilities Act accessible sidewalks project. This part of the project will rebuild the two ramps on the southeast corner of 60th Avenue and East Burnside to meet current ADA compliance. In addition, the project will also pr provide safe landing next to signal pole and signal activation push buttons. All affected property owners have been contacted by phone and or mail about the city's needs for the property rights and have been invited to attend the reading of this council item. Ashley McLay, PBOT right-of-way agent, is here to quickly explain the details and answer any questions. Welcome, Ashley. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Ashley McLay and I'm a PBOT right-of-way agent. I am joined today by Jim Scanlon, project manager, who will provide an overview of the project. Good morning. Thank you for the time today. <clears throat> I'm the designer for this project. Uh, I'll just briefly go through a couple of slides. Uh, I'm My personal information is I'm a member of the PBOT team. 
I'm part of the ADA ramp crew. We are charged with ensuring that the city delivers 1,500 ADA compliant ramps per year for the public benefit. We both design and supervise consultant designs for those ramps. Uh, they come to us from multiple sources, CIP, private development, and also our ramps by request program where people of, uh, with disabilities can specific, request specific improvements in their neighborhoods for the public benefit. Uh, this ramp came to us as a project to complete improvements to the intersection that were begun by the MO, maintenance operations. And those other three corners were completed in 2019. The project location is two blocks north of the Mount Tabor grade school. Uh, the southeast corner does not meet current compliance. The, the pedestrian crossings are signal controlled by push buttons. And the push button activation requires a level landing next to the push button. There's not sufficient existing right away to build an ADA compliant ramp. I apologize, I meant to be sharing my screen. Uh, is the screen visible now? No, it's still not visible. Uh, maybe um, uh, Keelan can assist you. Oh, it just popped up. Okay, very good. A little bit of delay. A little bit of delay. This slide so represents... Is the chart that we're on. Okay, very good. And uh, I've just talked through these elements, uh, establishing the existing conditions coming into it. Here is a slide that shows a picture, an aerial picture of the intersection. The lower left-hand corner of the top picture represents the corner that we are improving. Uh, the uh, ground level picture in the lower left-hand corner is a street view of the pole that we need the pedestrians to be able to access. <clears throat> Lower right hand is a picture of the footprint for an ADA compliant uh, or a wheelchair rather and establishes the geometry we have to work around. This project will rebuild the two ramps. It'll provide a safe landing next to the signal pole and the signal activation push buttons and it'll complete the intersection improvements. Uh, and then I believe Ashley will be talking about the right-of-way component. Thank you, Jim. So agenda item 361 gives PBA authority to compensate affected property owners for the needed right-of-way and easements, and if necessary, to condemn these property rights associated with this project. Uh, for this project, permanent right-of-way and temporary construction easement from one property owner have been identified as necessary to allow for the construction of ADA compliant ramps and sidewalk facilities within the project corridor. The affected property owner has been informed of the project need and was invited to attend this hearing, this reading. Uh, uh, with that, thank you for your time. If council has any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you for that presentation. Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you. Very good. And that completes the full presentation. Any questions, colleagues? This is a um, ordinance. Yeah, do we have anyone signed up to testify? Um, yes. Is there any public testimony, Keelan? No one signed up for this item. All right. This is a first. Actually, no. It's a uh, um, what do you call it? An emergency ordinance. An emergency. <laughs> call, the, call the roll. Ryan. Thank you, Ashley and Jim. Great presentation. I vote aye. Artisty. Excellent presentation. Forgive us. We're past due for lunch, so we're fading fast. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. 
I just want to say thank you to Commissioner Hardesty, um, Ashley, and Jim. Um, I used to live right near this intersection, and it's a really busy one, and this work is really, really needed. So thank you for this important project. I vote aye. Wheeler. Can only help. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thanks for the great presentation. 362, please. Authorize the Bureau of Transportation to acquire certain permanent and temporary rights necessary for construction of the signal rebuild Southeast 52nd Avenue and Southeast Woodstock Boulevard project through the exercise of the city's eminent domain authority. Commissioner Hardis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The ordinance before us allows Peabody to be placed a traffic signal at Southeast 52nd and Woodstock to protect left turning movements. A much needed improvement if you've ever tried to turn left at this location, and I have, and it's not easy. In addition, the project will include ADA corner ramps, upgrades, and intersection paving. All affected property owners have been contacted by phone and or mail about the city's needs for the property rights and have been invited to attend the meeting of this council item. Ashley, Ashley McLay is also here to present on this one. So Ashley, I didn't uh, I didn't appreciate you in the first one because I knew you were coming right back. So good morning again. Um, I am joined today for this ordinance uh, by David Backus, who's the project manager of this project. Thank you. I um, thank you, Ashley, Mayor, and Commissioners. David Backus, Peabot Capital Project Manager. I hear everyone is hungry, so I'll keep this brief and just do a quick project overview uh, before turning it back over to Ashley to go over the right-of-way needs. So as the commissioner mentioned, this is Southeast 52nd and Woodstock. It's a complete traffic signal rebuild um, right here in the middle of the map. Um, so this was really a community-driven effort that came out of the Woodstock neighborhood. Um, on the next slide, I'll show just a quick clip of uh, some of the emails we have received over the years about this traffic signal. Um, once we got notifications from the neighborhood, this was vetted through our signals and street lighting team. And um, the signal is a great candidate for replacement. It's an older signal. Uh, it's expensive to maintain. Um, and so this will help reduce our future maintenance burden on the city. It also improves safety for all road users, not just people trying to turn left. Um, but if you can picture yourself wanting to turn left, right now the only real way to do it is uh, when the light turns yellow or sometimes red. And at that point, you're really hoping someone's not trying to cross the street in the crosswalk. Um, it can cause a really dangerous situation. So this separates pedestrian crossings and left turning movements, uh, reduces red light running and, and all of that. Uh, so the scope, like I said, construct a new modern traffic signal, protect the left turns uh, from Woodstock onto 52nd, bring all of the corners up to current ADA standards, repave the intersection, which is uh, necessary. We were told that the paint, if we put it down for the crosswalks, wouldn't stick because uh, the road is kind of crumbling in that intersection. Um, and adding high visibility crosswalk markings to make the crossing safer and more pleasant uh, for pedestrians. So here's just a, a very brief snapshot of some of the emails we've gotten. Um, it, like I said, was a community driven effort, but um, folks are very concerned about safety at the intersection. And um, this is a, a response to the 823 safe phone calls and email um, requests and, and complaints over the last few years. And with that, uh, we can get into the right-of-way details. Thank you, David. So item 362 gives Peabot authority to compensate affected property owners uh, for needed right-of-way and easements, and if necessary, to continue for these property rights. Um, for this project, a permanent right-of-way and temporary construction easement from one property owner has been identified as necessary to replace the traffic signal and also to upgrade the ADA um, the affected property owner has been informed of the project um, and the need for these property rights, and um, they were invited to this reading. Um, so that concludes our presentation. If council has any questions, we would be more happy to answer them. Very good. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions? Keelan, is there any public testimony on this item? No one signed up for this item. Very good. This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Ryan. 
Thank you again, Ashley and David. Great presentation. I love the slide with the emails. That was awesome. I vote aye. Artisty. Thank you, Ashley, for your very important work. Um, every day people are being injured on our streets because of poor infrastructure and lack of uh, maintenance uh, in these very vital areas of our city. Um, you've got a tough job because your job is actually to really prioritize what we can do with the limited resources that we have. I applaud your work, uh, Ashley and David, um, and look forward to these improvements uh, being realized. I noticed on your letter, it said Commissioner Salsman, so it tells me how long the community has been waiting for these improvements. Uh, I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. I want to thank um, Ashley and David again for their presentation and Commissioner Hardesty for bringing this forward. Thanks for this important work. I vote aye. Wheeler. This is great. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you everybody for that. Next up is item 363, a second read. Authorize a five-year joint development agreement with Pierce Manufacturing Inc. for a reduced carbon emissions fire apparatus not to exceed $837,875. This is Commissioner Hardesty. A second reading, Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, I'm happy to support this. I'm really excited about it, actually. It's great to uh, do what we can within our own lane to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Uh, thank you for this innovation, Commissioner Hardesty. I vote aye. Hardesty. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Ryan, for that. Um, I, too, am very giddy about the feature of fire and rescue. I am very happy to vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Thank you to Commissioner Hardesty and the Fire Bureau for bringing this very exciting opportunity forward. This is exactly the sort of innovation we need to reduce our emissions. I vote aye. Wheeler. I strongly support the strategies around alternative fuel sources. Um, this does that. We should also look at operational opportunities to reduce our carbon emissions. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 364. Authorize grant agreements with six nonprofit organizations through the Diversity and Civic Leadership Program for $851,646 for the period July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2022. Commissioner Hardesty. Also a second reading, Mayor. Um, I don't show that. 364 is a second reading. Yes, you may remember Commissioner Ryan pulled it off the consent agenda. We had lively conversation last week. It's back now for a second reading. Uh, can I get confirmation on that, please, from Council? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. Actually, my bad. Uh, uh, I thought it was the other list of grants that we talked about recently. Oh, okay. This is right. actually yeah. the Diversity and Civic Leadership Program. Got it. Okay. My uh, apologies. An intro on this. Uh, yes, I am going to turn this over to the incredible um, Andrea Williams, who runs this program out of the Office of Civic Life. Andrea, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Mayor's Commissioner, thank you so much for the opportunity to present on Civic Life's Diversity and Civic Leadership Grant Program. Um, as the Commissioner said, I'm Andrea Williams. I'm Civic Life's Partnerships Manager, and I'm going to co-present alongside my colleague, Shogarth Jonath, who's also here. We'll provide a quick summary of the program. Um, and we've also invited two Leadership Program graduates from NEA and UNITE to give you a a deeper sense of the program and they'll provide a brief um, summary of their experience. Thank you, Andrea. Could I ask you to, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're a bit over time and we're going to come back to council at two. Um, if you could abbreviate your presentation, um, I'm, uh, you know, because uh, we're just running a lot over today, I would be greatly appreciative. Sure. Um, Keelan, if, uh, we'll do our best. Keelan, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the slideshow, that would be great. Um, so I'll keep my, my comments super brief, um, especially since we have two guests here. 
Um, just to give you a sense of what the program is. So if you could go to the next slide, Keelan, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so just to give, um, especially new commissioners, a, a sense of what this program is. Um, the Diversity and Civic Leadership Program is a program that enhances civic engagement among BIPOC, immigrant, and refugee communities. Um, and it's really done through six DCL organizations who are our partners. Um, and they're organized with us to uh, carry out three interdependent goals. One is to increase community building and civic engagement opportunities for BIPOC, immigrant, and refugee communities. Um, the second is to support communities in, perform in pursuing forms of governance that reflect their lived experience through cohort-based models of leadership development. Um, and the third is to build connections across communities and community-based organizations. Um, and you can see on the slide right here, um, on the next slide, um, the different program outcomes uh, that we are hoping to achieve through this program um, in collaboration with these six um, diversity and civic leadership partners, ERCO, Latino Network, Momentum Alliance, NEA, Unite Oregon, and Urban League. So next slide, please. Um, and so as you uh, have seen, this ordinance really authorizes civic life to administer these six uh, grant agreements with these six partners for a one-year term. Um, and that this total 851,646 um, really maintains the previous fiscal year's allocation. Um, you know, we wanted to um, do our best to reflect our Bureau's budget advisory committee recommendations, as well as the mayor's budget guidance to prioritize communities most impacted by COVID and racial inequities. Um, and I just finally wanted to mention that this year marks the 12th year of the diversity and civic leadership cohort. Um, it's been a very successful 12 uh, last years. And um, we're also cognizant that there's a lot of other partners and potential communities we could be working with. And so in that vein, Civic Life plans to la launch a public and competitive request for proposals process to select a 22-23 cohort. So just wanted to make sure council was aware of that. I'm gonna hand it to my colleague Shook to share a little bit more about the program. Thank you, Andrea. Next slide, please. Yes, <clears throat> good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, you see, this is the Budget for Diversity and Civic Leadership Program. We're requesting your approval for a total of $851,646, which amounts to $141,941 for each partner, for each of the six partners. As you see, we also put the last column on the right uh, to show uh, organizational budget capacity for each partner here, uh, showing the proportion of the civic life funding in their entire organizational revenue. And again, the total is 851,646. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the chronological history and administration of the DCL program. Uh, in 2010, the council ordinance authorized 74.7 thousand for five partners. In 2012, the ordinance authorized funding at uh, 79.7 thousand for each partner. In 2016, the organization uh, Momentum Alliance was added to the DCL cohort and became our sixth partner with authorized amount of 65 thousand dollars. From uh, 2012 to fiscal 2019. The funding for the DCL program renewed through grant agreement amendments with gradually increased funding. This current year, uh, 2020, the ordinance authorized 141,000 for each of the six partners. And as a previous budget table showed, we're requesting the same amount of funding for the next fiscal year. Next slide, please. Council members, uh, next I would like uh, to invite our two partner representatives, Simone Auger and Mani Jim Mechanouj from NIA and Unite Oregon respectively, to feature the impact of the DCL program on the beneficiaries and program participants. And I would like to pass to Simone first and Mani Jim after that. Thank you. Next, oh, sorry. Good afternoon. Mayor Wheeler and members of the council, for the record, my name is Simone Auger and I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. I'm also a proud alum of the Oregon LEAD program provided through the Native American Youth and Family Center, or NEA. 
The LEAD program is funded through the Diversity and Civic Leadership Program within the Office of Community and Civic Life. In the Leadership, Entrepreneurial, and Apprenticeship Development Program, otherwise known as LEAD, participants have the opportunity to take part in a year-long leadership and professional skills development curriculum grounded in a manner that is culturally relevant and responsive. As a Native American with strong ties to my culture and community, this is what sets the program apart from others. In the leadership, I'm sorry, the Oregon LEAD cohort experience and LEAD alumni network are key components of the leadership development program, affirming cultural identity through peer-to-peer -peer relationships that provide lasting value for years to come. As a graduate of LEAD, I'm grateful to have been part of an amazing cohort where we participated in monthly trainings and workshops, connecting with one another through shared experiences. The LEAD curriculum was well-crafted with meaningful personal growth exercises weaved in with impactful workshops with Native professionals where we learned about the different styles of leadership, community organization, communication, advocacy, fundraising, and organizational management. The leadership program through the NEA LEAD, the leadership education through the NEA LEAD program helped me advance both personally and professionally and helped equip me to better serve my community as I stepped into new roles. Currently, I serve as a congressional fellow through the Hatfield Fellowship Program. NEA's LEAD program played a part in my journey to serve in this capacity, and I continue to benefit from the leadership training, insight, and engagement we experienced with dynamic leaders through this program. Funding for the program and services such as NEA's Oregon LEAD program will provide other emerging leaders with the opportunity to grow in their leadership capacity and I urge you to continue this funding uh, into next year. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Simone and Mani J from Unite Oregon. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners and everyone. Um, thank you so much for giving me this chance to um, present my uh, case about pilot program. Um, for, your, for the record, my name is Manije Mehnoush and I am Unite Oregon's board co-chair and a pilot graduate of 2012. And the diversity and civic leadership funds in this program and uh, this leadership program. And here is what I like to say about pilot, the pan-immigrant leadership and organizing training program. And uh, this pilot program is uh, very diverse and um, opened my heart to so many cultures, multitude of cultures. And it's a judgment-free space um, and for the, where the, all the um, participants feel welcome and uh, special, uh, including all the immigrants and um, refugees. Uh, which I myself am an immigrant from Iran. And one of the ways that we know that to fight injustice through discrimination is uh, educating people. And to me, United Oregon is like a beautiful university that pilot is one of the colleges in that university. Uh, the workshops and uh, that we experienced while we taking the pilot program taught us about injustice and civil responsibility. They were so intense that it brought us to tears. And um, when we were acting as a um, kind of um, real thing and we, we had this skit playing that um, program about injustice and civic responsibility. And today as a pilot alumna, uh, I am a member of diversity advisory board for the city of Beaverton. And also I am a civic life bureau advisory committee member for the city of Portland. I also started working with Emerge, uh, the in interfaith um, movement for immigrant justice uh, and other organizations as well. 
um, all of these doors of civic engagement kind of were open to me because of this pilot program. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for pilot. And uh, this year, our theme for pilot was East Portland, Portland Prosperity and our 2020 uh, to 20, 21 pilot class represents 21 different countries of origin and participants speak 37 different languages. For the first time this year's um, pilot members are leading conversations and workshops about environmental justice and sustainability in their own communities in four different languages. We launched our first pilot con cohort in 2007, and we have 280 pilot graduates, including myself, representing 81 countries. I'm just one of those 28, 280 graduates. Other, uh, the other graduates have gone on to become elected officials, lead civic uh, in, in initiatives, and become inspirational leaders in their communities. When you continue funding this pilot program, you continue, continue building and strengthening our city. I am positive you won't regret your decision to fund this leadership program. And thank you so much for your understanding and support. Thank you. Thank you, Simone and Mani J. And next slide is uh, questions. All right, excellent presentation. Well done and thank you all for presenting to the city council today. Colleagues, any questions on this item? Keelan, do we have any public testimony? No one signed up for this item, Mayor. All right, good. Well, with that, then, we will take our vote. Good presentation. Please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, I'm excited to support this. Um, nothing like building leadership capacity. Earlier, there was the term return on investment. This is uh, right up there with uh, one of the best. I vote aye. Hardesty. I'm really uh, proud of the work that's been done over the year as part of this um, grant process. Um, it's hard to believe that it's been 12 years since this program was created. Um, and clearly it has had an impact in, um, in our community and an impact on civic engagement. Um, this is the last year this program will operate like this, is, however, because it is important that this opportunity is made available for a lot of community members who desperately need this kind of training. And so I certainly look forward to working with the groups who have the historic perspective about how we make this opportunity available for more uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, and other organizations. Um, and uh, so this is kind of a legacy program moving into this final year looking like this. And I'm excited about what the future holds for us because we have many opportunities to build civic engagement intentionally. And I want you to know I'm committed to doing just that. So I'm happy to vote aye today uh, for this report, for this funding. Um, and I look forward to working with uh, uh, community-based organizations and my city colleagues about how this program evolves um, to continue to do the good work that is done. Thank you. Maps. Um, I'm going to vote yes on this today, but I also feel compelled to say that um, Civic Life is obviously a bureau in transition, and it pains me to invest in a bureau until I know where it's going. Um, but I will vote yes on this because I trust Commissioner Hardesty to reform and reimagine the Office of Civic Life. And I know and trust uh, many of the organizations that are funded by this project. Um, that's why I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I want to thank everyone for the presentation. And I'm also very excited that the city will continue uh, to support DCL today. Um, I'm also very interested in learning about um, what my colleague mentioned about the innovations that are to come. Look forward to that conversation. 
Um, I have the fortunate experience of working with these programs for over the last 12 years firsthand. And I can tell you it's um, been very effective and, and, and essential um, in facilitating a lot of engagement for thousands of Portlanders over that time. Um, and these trusted organizations have served as their first engagement for many of them with the city. Um, and these programs typically rely um, heavily in, on in-person presence for intimate connection and work, but during COVID they had to recalibrate and adapt. And so I would just wanna lift that up. Um, our partners were able to maintain a high quality of service to the community and enhance their level of engagement at a time when creative civic engagement was so vitally important Important over these last 14 months and, and important in sustaining community connection. So thank you to the DCL partners for continuing um, this uh, really vital work and I look forward to hearing updates. I vote aye. Wheeler. Happy to support this. Appreciate the, uh, the presentation. Thank you all for two who took the time to do that this morning. I vote aye. And uh, the ordinance is adopted. Next 365, please. Authorize Bureau of Environmental Services to acquire certain permanent and temporary property rights necessary for construction of the South Portland Burlingame Phase Two Sewer Rehab Project through the exercise of the city's eminent domain authority, project number E11080. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, colleagues, environmental services provide sewage and water, stormwater collection services for the city of Portland. Our mission is to meet the city's current and future sewer and stormwater needs while also protecting public health, water quality, and the environment. Uh, this project is in the Burlingame area of South Portland. Our task here is to repair and replace deteriorating sewer pipes that are between 60 and 120 years old and at the end of their service life. Uh, to make the needed repairs and sewer pipe installation, environmental services needs to acquire permanent and temporary easements before the spring of next year. Here today with a brief presentation are uh, Joe Dvorak, engineering manager with EES, Daniel Boatman, project manager with environmental services, and Ashley McLay, uh, right-of-way agent for Peabody. Uh, I'll turn it over to staff now. Great. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, Joe Dvorak with the Bureau of Environmental Services. We have a very short presentation prepared for you and uh, available for questions at the end. So, Daniel, I'm going to turn it over to you now to run through the slides, please. All righty. Thanks, Joe. Let me see. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen just fine. Um, so, as mentioned, uh, I'm here with Joe and Ashley McClay. It looks like this is Ashley's third presentation, so thank you, Ashley, for sticking in here. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, this project uh, will be, uh, will go out to bid later on this year, but ahead of it, we needed to secure property rights on one property in particular. Um, and that is 8625 Southwest 10th Avenue. We have an existing easement, a uh, pipe going through an existing easement in private property, and um, that pipe is failing and in need of repairs. Um, so here's a, an overview of the property, um, and you can see um, the orange hash line here is the existing easement, and this highlighted blue line is the pipe that we'll be repairing. Um, in order to access the pipe, we'll need to go in through their driveway, and um, and so we're uh, and in order to maintain the pipe in the future, we'll need to expand the existing easement. Uh, so this ordinance is about obtaining the um, property rights for the temporary construction easement and and an additional permanent easement to maintain the pipe in the future. Uh, we've been reaching out to the property owner directly through our public outreach group and we'll continue to do so during construction. Um, to date, we've had, uh, they've been on board with the repairs and um, are, yeah, they're on board with, with getting the work done. Um, the, the construction method for this will be an open excavation spot repair we'll, where we'll just repair a, a short section of the pipe. Um, 
And I might ask Ashley to jump in here if there's any questions regarding the right of way work itself, but the permanent sewer easement will be approximately 15 foot wide, which is our standard for maintaining an existing sewer. Um, they'll, it, in the lower left, you can see the three temporary construction easements that will be required in order to complete the repairs. Um, so those are supplemental to the permanent easement that's shown on the top right. Um, there was a, um, the market value of this work or, or of the easements was determined by an independent appraisal. Last I knew it came out to $9,300. Ashley, could, could you confirm that? Uh, yes, the uh, just compensation for this project, uh, for these easements is less than $10,000. Thank you, Ashley. Um, we are anticipating notice to proceed next year in spring. And, um, and we hope to acquire the property interest by the time we start. So essentially by March 1st. And that is all I have in my slideshow. I always like to kind of get a historic um, picture of the neighborhood that we're working in, just so um, we've got a bit of the culture and the presentation as well. So this is up on Hume Street, just a, a little bit north of, of where the pipe and private property is. And let me stop sharing screen. Commissioner Hardesty, while they're doing that. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I answered my own question. Very good. Colleagues, any further questions on this item? Is there any public testimony on this item? No one signed up. Very good. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Last but not. Thank you. Three, thank you. 366. Amend fee schedule for tree permits. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, fees help provide essential tree services to residents uh, paying part of the cost of Portland Parks and Recreation Urban Forestry, performing its responsibilities as directed in Title 11 and the Urban Forest Management Plan. The Title 11 tree fee schedule for the 21-22 fiscal year incorporates 5% increases to most development fees, with some fees increasing more than 5% to better recover costs of these services. Fees for non-development permits, such as tree removal and replacement applications will remain unchanged. Our city foresters here uh, to provide more information and to answer any questions you might have, and I'll turn it over to her now. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Good afternoon, city council. Um, I also wanna recognize that urban forestry analyst, Brian Lando is here and he'll be sharing his screen so you can see the proposed changes. And I wanna also recognize Brian for his work on the fee schedule update. So Brian, if you could go ahead and share that. Uh, the park's Title 11 tree fee schedule generally covers two types of permits and review fees, development and non-development. Uh, development fees cover the cost of parks urban forestry providing services such as early assistance plan review, um, tree preservation, planting, and other services and requirements associated with property development activity. And the fees, as Commissioner Rubio said, are intended to cover the cost of this service in full. However, at present, they, they don't uh, recover costs fully. Non-development permit fees, such as tree removal and replacement applications, are set below cost recovery to limit barriers to code compliance. Uh, the proposed fee schedule you see here uh, increases most development fees by 5%. And in the, the sheet in front of you, you can see the column to the right, which is in red. Those are the new proposed fees. And to the left with the strike through are the current fees. One development fee, final planting inspection, is increasing from $229 to $302. And that's to be consistent with other fees that have a comparable amount of labor associated with them. Also, you'll see the public works fee is being split into three distinct fees, review, final inspection, and reinspection. This change brings 
parks permit fee structure in line with other bureaus that also conduct public works permits. Um, and as I mentioned before, fees for non-development uh, permits remain unchanged. And if you could scroll down and, and show that, Brian. You can see those there. Um, that concludes the information I had prepared for you. If there are any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Colleagues, any questions? Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Jen, and Commissioner uh, Rubio uh, for uh, this important um, ordinance. I actually have a question, and I'm almost fearful to raise it because last year we got into a really big conversation around um, the penalties, right, when people violate and they remove a tree and they shouldn't, and whether or not we were actually charging enough as far as penalties were concerned. Mm -hmm. um, and it we, doesn't look like we're raising the cost of what happens when people violate the rules um, and don't actually do uh, go through the process as it relates to uh, protecting trees in our community. Um, I would think at a time of uh, at a time where we need to actually recover more costs that we would review the violations and whether or not the penalties actually fit the environment, the time that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, I think the violations, those fees are um, uh, 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 really, really low. Um, and I think the developers write it in as the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. um, and so do you have data that actually proves or disproves uh, the premise that I'm putting on the table? Thanks for the, commission, the question, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, so to clarify something, the penalties, and Brian, if you could scroll down further, um, where there are violations and therefore enforcement fees, these fees and enforcement on the lower part of the page here generally don't apply during development because in property development, instead what happens is folks, the folks applying for the permits through Bureau of Development Services have to go and revise and correct things uh, rather than the enforcement fees being activated, which are really more focused on the non-development regulations being implemented. And to answer your question about, do we know if these are accurate or not? Um, we do fairly routinely review and see where violations have occurred, whether the, the monetary um, implications are accurate. Uh, and at present, we're fairly comfortable with these, again, for the non-development situation. Um, but your point is definitely a good one and we will continue to review those for future iterations. Thank you. Welcome. Very good. Colleagues, any other questions? Elin, any testimony on this item? No one signed up, Mayor. All right, good. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. And with that, we are adjourned until 2 p.m. Thank you, everybody.